this computer. All right, so I don't, okay, so I am now recording. As I was gonna say, I don't have my computer, or I have it with me, but I don't have the charger, which is at home, plugged into the living room. I'm using one of the school's uh, desktop, uh, laptop computers, the ones in the lab. As you can see, I am in the lab this morning. So the first thing I'm gonna ask everybody is just be patient with this. I have used online tools like this before in Blackboard. Uh, obviously you've seen my recordings. I've used like PowerPoint to do it. So I am familiar with how, how to do it. I, I hooked up the, the microscope actually. I'll show you a picture of that in a second uh, to show you some slides or the slides you would see today. So I'm gonna try to recreate lab as much as I possibly can, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna leave that for actually get into lab. I set the recording on this to be from eight o'clock until lab ends at 11.30, but I think what I'm going to do based on maybe file size or something is I'll probably stop this one at the end of lecture and then start another one when we get into lab. So there might be two Zoom meetings that you need to, that you need to get into. I did send an email uh, this morning just right before class to get the links. So if you have friends of yours who are having trouble getting online and, and, and texting you and such, classmates, let them know that there is a link in their email, uh, a Zoom link about how to get online. Um, it looks like most of you were able to do that pretty well. I see that uh, many of you have your microphones live and your video live. That's all well and good. I have no problem with that. I only ask is we use that on a, on a, uh, on a need as needed basis. In other words, if everybody's mic is live, <laughs> it's, I have three dogs. So if we were at home, I'd be saying I'd be the first one that this would be a problem with and I can't mute my mic, but the dog's barking in the background every time somebody walks by the door or anything, right? Emily is older and she barks at sounds that nobody hears. So anyway, um, that would, it would be great if you would mute your mics. Uh, it, if you're not speaking, of course, you can unmute it and talk to me. That's, that's no problem at all. The video, yeah, if you want to show me something like a, a specimen or you want to, uh, I don't know, if you want to show me something, you're more than welcome to turn your camera on. But again, the more cameras that are on, the more that are going to lag. And it looks like I don't have, does it look good on your end as far as lag? Now, there, there's the chat function too. So you can chat to me answers like that. You don't have to say anything, but it doesn't matter to me how you do it. But it looks like the quality is pretty good. I'm not seeing where it's hitching anywhere. Sometimes in Blackboard, that would be a problem. All right, um, so if, I don't, if I'm not hearing anything, I'm gonna assume you guys are not having any issues. So please let me know if you do. I assume everybody can hear me by now. Everybody has found the chat feature, uh, which should be in a pull down somewhere. I'm sorry, that's a little bit vague, but again, Zoom is not new to me in terms of what I'm doing but it's new to me in terms of where all the bells and whistles are. Okay, um, oh, let me see, make sure this is working. I tried it with a couple of people before class, but I just wanna make sure everybody can see this. I'm gonna switch the camera for a second. The other camera I have hooked up is on a microscope slide, which is on right now. So you should in just a second see, let's see. Oh God, it look awful. Man. There we go. So do you see something that looks like you're obviously looking through a microscope slide? It's something that's nicely stained, uh, blue and, and, and red. Cool. Yeah, everybody can see that? Nice. All right, so that's the slides you're gonna look at today. And you know, as I'm playing with this, I'm thinking, wow, this would be good that I'm recording it. Maybe I'll use this as kind of a little uh, study guide or tutorial for you know, folks who wanna look over this stuff again. Now, you guys aren't gonna be able to take a look at it if, we do get back in class, and I'll get to that in just a second. Um, I'm going to have all these slides available for you, but that's, a, that's pretty good. I think that'll work for what we need to talk about. As far as getting back into class, you know there's no classes for the, for the first two weeks uh, starting now. It's all going to be remote. No, I'm sorry, scratch, not no classes. Everybody's like, ah, oh, snow day. Huh? No, there's, um, uh, there's, everything's going to be remote, lab and lecture. Uh, it, it may change after two weeks. We may have you guys come back on campus for some labs or lectures. I, I don't see that really happening, to be honest, although it might. So keep that in the back of your mind. Please not try not to clutter up your Mondays uh, for two weeks out uh, because you may end up having to come to campus. Although, again, that's probably not, not going to be the case. I'm going to switch back to me. Um, all right, so that's as far as that goes. I'm gonna keep you guys constantly updated. I sent you a big email last night. I've been sending you video emails with updates and I get tired of typing. It's holy cow, I've sent a thousand emails this last week, I'll bet you. But um, please do take a look at those because sometimes things are gonna change really quickly. 
we, uh, we, we won't have like uh, lectures on Wednesday. We, we didn't. You have the recordings to view and homeworks to do, so that's not going to change. Labs, of course, are going to be online, so next Monday we'll meet online again. Uh, probably through the same thing. I was, it looks like the Zoom thing is working pretty well. Uh, we'll see when we get into the lecture and the, and the lab how well it works, but uh, so far it seems good. Uh, but I will keep you guys of any changes. But at this point, treat this as Mondays being remote, that you're going to be meeting with me online or you're going to be viewing this recording later on. Or, you know, you can view it again. It's, it, this is also a nice thing to study from. Plus, now you got a lot of videos. I'll make, I'll make the animals videos that I recorded previously. Uh, I'll make those links on to Canvas too. If I forget somebody, holler at me and let me know. Oh gosh, what a, what am I forgetting? Uh, your other classes in school, they should all be remote as well. So if there's any questions about do I need to be anywhere on campus for the first two weeks, no, there's no reason you should be. There's no student activities. I, I'm the only one in the building today, probably one of the few people on campus, and that's only because I have to meet somebody up here to help them uh, figure out how to do Zoom on their computer. So uh, I'll probably be remote. Uh, well, I am remote right now, Steve, but anyway, I may not be on campus doing lectures in the future, but anyway, that's no big deal. I will keep you, uh, keep you informed of where the links to, to, to view, to get online. Were there any problems with anybody today getting on Zoom and, and uh, getting loaded and everything? I'm guessing that's kind of a silly question since you guys are all online. I'm hoping nobody is uh, having difficulties now. Give me one second, let me jump over to my other computer and see if they got an email from somebody asking how to get online. I just want to make sure that I'll be right back. Okay, now I'm gonna, I'm gonna erase this because now I can. So what I decided to do is, um, oh gosh, let me make sure I touch everything about the, the virus and all that. Any questions on that? I'm sorry, you know, I keep jumping around, but there's a million, administrative housekeeping things like I to get out of the way. Okay, you know, you can, um, cool. You can always email me. I'm checking my email every day now. Well, I checked it every day anyway, but I'm checking it constantly, even on the weekends and stuff, because it's not just you guys, you got faculty and other things going on. So there's a lot of emails bouncing around right now. So, but don't hesitate to email me on anything. Um, I emailed you about your field notebook, oh, uh, uh, the exams, exams are going to still occur, right? Next Monday is your third exam over the fungus protists, prokaryotes, oh, I can't remember, seedless plants, no, not protists, just seedless plants and seeded plants, right? Anyway, the plants, where's my notebook? Yeah, 25 and 26, so seeded plants and seedless plants. Okay, so that's your exam next week. That will occur. It will be online. It will be remote. Uh, I haven't exactly figured out the format yet. I got a good idea in my head. Um, I mean, there's only so much I can do when it comes to protecting the exam. I have to depend on you guys and your sense of professionalism and dedication to learning this stuff. The bio two course, I'm thinking if you're taking it, you got a little more vested interest in what you're learning. Otherwise you're just taking general bio and something else and moved on down the road, right? So I'm gonna try to do things to control that. But again, I just have to depend on you folks to be professionals about this. But we'll talk a little bit more about that as the exam draws closer. Lab practicals, not really sure. Probably gonna do those online. Well, I have to do those online. Have an idea of how I'm gonna do it. Um, have all the information I need to do it. So again, that'll be something that comes on down the road. But no anxiety if you're feeling anything about that at all. I know you got a lot of stuff going on with, uh, you know, home stuff, other classes. By all means, email me, email me, email me. Get in contact with me. We can even, if you have something you need to talk about, you and I or a group, y'all, uh, we can get together and do this. I can set up a Zoom meeting anytime you want. Okay, we have unlimited Zoom meetings. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the uh, seedless and the seeded plant worksheet that I said you guys was due last week because I got it in my head for some reason you were taking an exam on that, but it was due, right? I said I would take those points. I would look at those and give you, how many points did I say? I don't remember. Probably no more than five. I'll give you f up to five points depending on how you're doing that, depending on the exam. Okay. Yeah, third test, right? So just make sure. Anybody else got any questions? Am I missing anything? 
Thank you for being uh, adaptable and flexible and, you know, and, and, you know, just kind of rolling with this. This has been something I know first I said big blue button on, on canvas, but that, uh, that's a pain. Zoom is a lot better. Um, so I appreciate you guys kind of rolling with this. Uh, you take pic uh, uh, phew, I was just going to say, but it should have been turned in. Remember, even though it was for the third exam, it was due last uh, for the second exam. So it was, it was due. Oh, field notebooks. Speaking of that, yeah, I gave you guys a little email about that. I'm hoping, you know, this late in the semester, more or less, you guys have, hold on, let me respond to Lindsay. Uh, you've got most of your um, field notebook specimens. You've taken your pictures. Remember at the beginning of the semester, I said, uh, take a lot of pictures and this is a good time to sit down and kind of compile all that and get the names and get all the other stuff filled in. I, I still am going to want them do, oh, what did I say? And I don't want to misspeak. I'm really bad about dates and I'm horrible about confusing people with them. Eight, uh, 8th of April at eight o'clock and they're the e-portfolios. So if you have any questions on that, make sure you get that squared away. I know you can't leave and go anywhere, but like I said, you can honestly find, oh my goodness, well, if you don't have a lake on where you live, then that's going to be a problem, but it is Florida. But I mean, you can find this stuff anywhere, you know, but no landscaping plants, but you got a lot of stuff growing out near your house that, that, um, that will work, okay? If it's a major challenge for some reason, because, you know, and I don't know everybody's circumstances when it comes to what, how this virus is affecting you, but if it's a major challenge to get those, please email me. Let's talk about it, okay? So maybe we can, maybe we can figure something out. I know these are, these are um, unusual times, so we're having to kind of develop this as we go along. So I appreciate again your patience, but keep me, keep me informed as well, too, of any problems or things that come up. I think I've covered um, everything. I think I have quarter after. That's, that's not too bad, 15 minutes. Anybody have any questions, anything I didn't answer, anything you know, related to the general idea of what the heck is going on with all this? Nice and quiet here this morning. Not exactly the way it's supposed to be, but. So I'm going to leave my video on until the point it begins to annoy me because I always think I'm looking up. I think you guys are always looking up my nose, which you probably are. If I set this thing right, it wouldn't be. But anyway, uh, or if I want to show something on the board, I don't know how that'll, well that'll work. I'll have to write big and dark, so you guys will have to help me with that. But I am going to, of course, use the slides in the background because that's what we're talking about today. And like I mentioned in the email the other day, now, I can watch both screens, so as I'm lecturing, don't think, oh, I have to wait till he pauses to chat, kind of like we do in class. Well, no, you guys just talk over me. Anyway, but <laughs> no, you can go ahead and chat. I can catch that with my other eye. Uh, with my other eye. <laughs> I have a pineal eye, like a reptile. I can, I can catch that, and I can respond to it. And so, just, so just go ahead and do that. You can also turn on your mic and ask a question, no problem. <sighs> I wanted to do this lecture live as much as I possibly could, and this is about as best as I possibly could right now because I love talking about animals. A, a, a few years ago, uh, Professor Carlins approached me about doing a TED Talk about what inspired me to get into biology. It still gives me goosebumps to think about it. It's, it made me kind of, you think, oh gosh, do you ever lose that thing? I, no, I never did. I love talking about this stuff. I always have. Teaching was always like, wow, I get paid to <laughs> most of my friends would say that I kind of bore them with sometimes, you know, because I just do enjoy talking about, but I don't, the thing I enjoy talking about the most are the other animals. And as we get the animals of fish, absolutely, absolutely, just in sharks. And I'm getting boost goosebumps right now. But anyway, yeah, so it, it, animals to me are the central core to why I get into biology. And I, I'm gonna get right back onto the science here in a second. But as I've said before, like when we talked about von Leeuwenhoek looking through the microscope and the protozoans, you gotta find that thing in your life that you go, Wow. Even two years down the road, three years down the road, five years down the road. I mean, they say folks change careers many times in their lives. So maybe it's something that happens more than once. But you want to work somewhere. You want to do something in your life that makes you still get goosebumps when you're an old guy like me. Right? You want that thing that comes across to go, I just, just dig this stuff. I always have. So, so that's why I wanted to do this one is live. And, and of course, one of my favorite critters out there, in addition to fish and, and sharks, and you're going to find out it makes sense when you think about, when we talk about the relationships amongst each other, 
is indicated in the background there of the slide. That looks very familiar, I'm hoping. I'm not looking for species, but just tell me what kind of critter, what kind of critter does that look like? Now again, this is where you can chat or, or type it in, or uh, it's like a snake to me, right? Now, if I were really up on all my stinks, if all my snake skins, I might be able to tell what species that is. That doesn't look like one I'm familiar with here in Florida. I'm, I'm fairly good about Florida snakes. Doesn't, it's also been obviously flattened out. It was probably taken off of some python or something like that. Anybody recognize, well, I was going to say who those are on the lower right. You, you may have. The Animals was a group back from the time, a little bit before my time, but they had a hit song called the House of the Rising Sun. And <laughs> I guess it just, irony is the source of humor. So to me, I love looking at this picture. These guys are called the animals, right? And I'm, they, they were young rock star folks, I guess, you know, in, a, in the Beach Boys, maybe, I don't know, maybe a little bit more than that, but they look very clean cut. You know, you're thinking back in that time, they probably weren't so clean cut, but you think, oh yeah, this, this kid's got a, a, a button shirt and a tie, and his hair is cut nice. Reminds me of the Beatles when they first came out and stuff. But it's kind of weird, the, the animals, and the, yet they look like that kid next door who mows my lawn. So <laughs> I think that's hilarious. We're going to talk about in Chapter 27 just a little bit about animal diver or animals in the sense that uh, we're not going to really talk too much about particular types. We do get into a few of those, and we'll do a little more of that in lab today. But we are going to talk about what it means to be an animal. And I think that's important, right? Because we've talked about, uh, oh, what it means to be a fungus. Give me, give me one characteristic of a fungus. You don't have to be real technical about it, but give me one thing you learned about fungi that you go, wow, that's what it, that's, fungi do that. I mean, I could say plants and you'd say photosynthesis and I'd say, great. It's like, you know, bio one, but how about fungi? What's unique about, what's, oh gosh, what's particularly unique about fungi? Purely <laughs> Well, hopefully not to your pants. Because if this is to your pants, then you might have a you might need to get to go see a doc. Um, yeah, hyphae is one, right? They make those hyphae, which you remember the things about hyphae or 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 kind of fit in with fungus. Fungus weren't really too much about the individual cell. Remember, they're really into being polynucleate. They would have these long continuous tubes, hyphae. They might have septum between them, little you know, with holes between them, but they were all connected. And and, and the, there were many nuclei within this tube. So there wasn't really a cell thing. It was more about the nucleus dividing. And that's very cool when you tie back to bio one, because remember in, um, in bio one, when you talked about uh, mitosis, you, there were two big steps in mitosis, right? Two big things that happened. I know you're thinking, wait, interface, prophase? No, those were all the first part, right? The part when the nucleus divides, right? Karyokinesis, and then the cell divides, cytokinesis. Well, what fungi did is they just skipped uh, the karyokinesis or the uh, cytokinesis. They just skipped the cell dividing because they said, well, the whole point of dividing the cell is to, is to divide up the, the nuclear material, the genetics, the DNA. Remember, it's all about the DNA. We reproduce because of DNA. We reproduce because of our DNA. It's a molecule inside of us that likes to make copies of itself. Remember that from bio one, and that's why we reproduce, right? <laughs> I think it's funnier if you have a symbiotic relationship in your pants, especially with a fungus. All right, I'm gonna, uh, uh, can I make this one? I'm gonna get rid of this one so I can see what I'm looking at. So anyway, the animals, nice kids, maybe not. All right, next uh, slide. Oh man, this is, uh, this is one of my favorite things uh, when we talk about uh, just diversity in general. I, cladograms that you guys did in class are relatively new to me in the sense that I didn't learn about those in school when I was in college, even in grad school. They were relative. They were. They were. They were not well. Well, they weren't used in a lot of places. They weren't common knowledge. But now, when I started teaching this bio two class, we didn't even talk about them. Now we do, and that's great because it's really making us understand this idea of how organisms are connected. And since now you've got this evolutionary background to you that we went through, this is all hopefully falling into place and and making sense. So this is a just a real basic eukaryotic organism cladogram, right? You've seen this before, it's familiar. I'm gonna move the chat box because I'm not looking there. You've seen this before, right? It looks familiar. We talked about it when we went through the protozoans. There was the a group of protozoans at the top called the excavata, and that included the, the diplomonads, the folks, the folks, protozoans with two nuclei. The sarclay, they got their name from, 
know, what is it? Yeah, the stromenopiles, the alveolates, the rhizarians. Remember the dash lines are where uh, job opportunities are where we don't know the relationships. And remember how this whole, the whole kingdom protista, right? It's polyphyletic, isn't it? Because if you look down through here, uh, there's some things that are mixed in with these protozoan groups, like for example, the archaeoblastida, the third ones down, the ones that have the plants, the green algae that are protozoans and the green algae that are plants, and then they got the plants, which aren't protozoans, they're in a different kingdom. So with that, within this cladogram of, let's say, the kingdom protista, there's another kingdom? No, cannot happen. What does that mean? It means that we don't have all the answers yet, right? We're filling all this in. And really, when we do have the answers, it does show us that when it comes right down to it, at some level, we're all related. Land plants are related to protozoans. And down there at the bottom, the part we're moving on to today, the part in the red, animals, right? Us, we're related to protozoans. We're in this big group, uh, this protestin group, right? It's called the unocanta. Right? The unocanta basically means uh, these are organisms that make a single cell with a flagella. Yeah, and it's a rear, uh, or, or you know, just a flagella. So if you're thinking, what does he talk about in animals? Or sperm cells would be an example of why we're in this unicanta group. Sperm cells, when they're flagellated, because like Euglena, way up there at the top, has a flagella, but it's on the front. We have a posterior flagella in our single cell. We don't walk around on the flagella, but you get the idea. But notice, you know, there's a the fungi, they're up there too, and they're not a, they're not a protozoan. They're in another kingdom again. Uh, the clanoflagellates, right below the, or right below the fungi, above the animals. Now they're they are protozoans. They're considered unicanta protozoans. I'm going to show you a picture of them in a second. Then I'm going to wow you, and show you. Um, and can I mix in lab? Hey, while I'm talking, why don't you guys get your lab notebooks open, or get a piece of paper or something, or if you have them on paper, what we'll do is we'll do like we do in lecture. We'll go ahead and move into lab as I move into these different groups. I do want to, that's what, the clanoflagellates got me thinking about that. But anyway, that's a protozoan, a clanoflagellate. Notice it's a, it's a flagellate. It has a flagella. And then uh, if you follow that branch, that sort of brown colored branch, you notice that our, they are our closest relatives, these clanoflagellate protozoans. They're more closely related to us than the fungus are and the plants are. And I've said this a million times, but you get the, you get the idea here that even though we call the kingdom protista polyphyletic, in a way, everybody's polyphyletic. You remember sitting and doing that lab that we did, we, we got together in groups and not everybody came out with exactly the same cladogram, but they all came out with reasonable cladograms, some more than others. But that means that the debate continues, right? And while we always like to say the simplest answer is probably, probably the best one, parsimony, simple cladograms, sometimes it's not so simple. Sometimes the complex answer is the right one. I think I was talking to y'all or some of the other day about, uh, no, I was, about uh, whale evolution, that the new evidence coming out looking at cladograms and looking at DNA, I got to take This is causing me a big headache. Ouch. Anyway, uh, looking at whale evolution, that whales, if you remember speciation, what we talked about. Oh, can I draw this? All right, I got to know if this, uh, if you can see this. Is, is that viewable? You might have to make, or is that, you know, you might have to make the screen a little bigger. I'm trying to see how much I can use the board. Can you guys see that? Yeah? All right, let me draw it really big. All right, so uh, whale evolution, right? So we start off with a whale ancestor, whomever that might be, and, and then speciation occurs and you know, it could be through cladogenesis, but more likely, uh, if it's speciation that I'm drawing, it's through punctuated equilibrium, right? It, it, it's, a, a, oh, I'm sorry, cladogenesis, which is punctuated equilibrium, happens in a short period of time. So we get all these different species. And here we are at some time, and that's how many species we have, how many lines of the cladogram are up to the present time. And then what recent evidence shows us is that in some cases, you remember talking about hybrids, these merged back together. So that became one, and then maybe these became one, and maybe this was the only one left. So we know what's happened in speciation is it's diverged and converged many times now looking at this information. So even though what we look at today for this particular cladogram we got here, they might find in the future these things weaved back and forth, weaved, 
weaved back and forth like a, uh, like, like a weave, right? That's kind of fascinating if you think about it. So where do we draw the line? Maybe, you know, go back to Aristotle again. Boy, we've gone a long way from him, huh? With the ladders and nothing in between. We know that there's a million, it's almost quantum. There's, a, there's an infinite number of steps in between. Right, so maybe that's what you have to do is move the screen back and helps if I get my head out of the way. The problem is I have my glasses on and I'm right in between not being able to see and being able to see. So what do we know about animals as far as uh, their evolutionary background, as far as their ancestry? The same ancestry that the plants and the fungus have. The same one that, and I always like to call it the, the protozoans are a basal, basal, B-A-S-A-L, a stem, uh, not, not, yeah, yeah, a basal group, a base group. So out of this bowl of protozoans that you're looking at right here came the animals and, and, and the plants and, 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 and then the fungi, right? No matter how you draw it, we're all related. There's nothing you can do about that. So, all right, good one too anyway. The best part about it, that's the part I love about uh, animals and biology too, is the idea of, man, no matter what, no matter the fact that I can sit here and think about them and talk about them and write about them and read about them, I'm one of them. I'm, I'm like, I'm in this, in this incredible biology. It's just, it's like being a member of a really cool club, which we are, but of course. Okay, let's talk about what it means to be an animal. An animal, for one thing, gets their food other places. We don't photosynthesize. There's no examples of that. There's no exceptions to that, is what I should say. And I usually I'm cautious about saying that, right? And usually I'm cautious about saying that everything's that way because i always know there's an exception but I, with the animals um uh, there there are no ex there are no exceptions no photosynthetic animals out there polar bears might get green because but they're not because they're being photosynthetic but because uh in the warmer months relatively speaking algae grows in their fur green algae <laughs> that's why they kind of look green sometimes so if you remember from different ways of nutrition back in the prokaryotes were a chemo Hetero, troph. Troph is to feed. Tell my bio one students, think of trough, or pig's feed maybe. Hetero is other, other feeding. You're not an autotroph. You don't feed yourself through photosynthesis. And the first part there is where you get your carbon, right? We don't get our, car we don't get our, excuse me, is where you get your energy, excuse me. The hetero, back up, troph is to feed. Hetero is where you get your carbon. We get our carbon from organic things, from food. Chemos, we get our energy from the breakdown of organic material, from food, from digestion. Plants don't do that. They get energy from the sun. Now that I screwed that up, it's a good thing you don't have to take an exam on that question again, do you? Animals are heterotrophs, right? We don't photosynthesize. We get both our carbon, that's bottom line, we both get our carbon and our energy from organic materials. We don't use the sun and we don't eat metal, like some things living on the Titanic. And we have tissues, finally I can say, well, yeah, almost. Finally, yeah, almost I can say that animals have tissues, not all of them. Some of them are pushing the limit because they're kind of straddling that line, but we'll take a look at those in a minute. That's why I put all but the periphera. Who do you think are the peripherans? Let's take a look at that name. Think of, a, think of an animal you might know, I was gonna say, it's not on the screen. It might be a peripheran. Probably Google it about it too, right? But if you look at the word, it's one thing about Latin that's really nice, and these words are all Latin or Latin based. They often have roots in them that we're familiar with because this is, we're a Latin based language, kind of, right? We have a lot of Latin influences. Um, so an animal or a critter, yeah, yeah. Did you, did you guys know that or just kind of take a, like a analytical, oh, there you go. <laughs> Thank you. Um, but again, right, pores, peripheral pores, an animal, a critter with a lot of pores. How many of y'all didn't know that sponges were animals? I knew that. Nobody's going to say that. But I bet you some, some of you might have thought, well, I'm not really sure. They, they're kind of an interesting animal. Yeah, did you? Yeah, they're, they're really sort of, yeah. my zoo professor in college used to always say, he's from Kentucky, so he had this really awesome accent that he'd lecture with. He'd go, they do so well with so little. He'd say, he said, Clark, don't you laugh at those sponges. He said, they do a heck of a job of being a sponge. Can you be a sponge? I always remember that. That really impacted me. Like, doggone, he's right. Even though we look at a sponge, and we'll look at one in just a, a second and when we get into a, a little bit. 
they do they do what they do pretty well. But when we move beyond the sponges and we start moving into some of the more, and I don't want to say advanced critters because that's not really the right way to say it evolutionarily speaking, let's say derived, you start seeing this really specialization that occurs. And if you look, if you look at the, on the right, obviously that's a bear at the top, um, but the jellyfish just below it. And a jellyfish has tissues, but a jellyfish is, and it has more tissue characteristics than a, than a sponge. A sponge is just a, a bunch of cells sticking together and almost like a, almost like we might say when we have biofilms and we had colonies and we have multicellular protozoans, brown allergies, right? So, uh, but jellyfish kind of go a little bit further. We don't really get into what, and I put exclamation mark uh, tissues for a question. We don't really get into tissues until these multicellular things become these really specialized uh, structural and functional units. And that's why in the third picture, what you're looking at is, a, what you're looking at is a synapse. You guys know what those are, right? That's a really microscopic picture of the juncture uh, well, between the muscle down below and the nerve up above. So there involves a synapse as well as that neuromuscular junction, right at that spot where those little fingers hanging down, that little thing that's peeking up is where those chemicals are going to be released and it's going to make, uh, uh, it's gonna make that, that muscle cell twitch. It's going to make it move. That's a very special, that's like a wire and a, and a motor, right? Isn't that cool? So yes, uh, while jellyfish move and, and they rhythmically pulse, right? They don't, have quite, they don't move like we do. They go, oh, I need to step over here. They just kind of bloop along because they're blooping. Make sense? Now to bloop along, to move along, or to have this uh, ability like the, the jellyfish has, the next thing is important. We can't have cell walls. Whether they're made of um, uh, cellulose like in plants or chitin. Cell walls are good if you're gonna stand still and you don't have a skeleton. But we are an animal. You're not really uh, you're not really into that because you're capable of the last characteristic on this slide, which is moving around a lot, active, complex movement. So you're not. And and again, the jellyfish kind of pushes the extreme. And do sponges move? There's a stage in them that does. Um, do plants move? Well, they turn toward the sun, but that's not what we'd consider complex movement, right? Although there's some weird of oh, those slime molds that we looked at that seem to have. You know, really bizarre, uh, complex kind of movement. But again, we're kind of lumping all these characteristics together. So saying generally among animals, you're going to have this much more rapid, complex, uh, like the butterfly flying around. Um, even though some organisms may be, be sessile, in other words, they don't move, they stay still. In many cases, they do have a part of them that moves, or maybe a, a, a part of their life cycle is what I'm saying, a part of their life cycle in which they move. So, And we'll, we'll talk about those. But if you're thinking... Um, I wonder if that's dispersal, then, then you're right, right? Because moving, if you're a sessile animal and you need to disperse your organism, it's kind of like plants and seeds, isn't it? A little different, you're not dispersing seeds, but you get the idea. So, so that's just the beginning though, because remember how we've talked about organism features throughout the semester is you, uh, an organism doesn't always have all the features and it doesn't mean that some of the features organisms have aren't found in other organisms. Uh, remember, the exoskeleton of insects is made of chitin. The cell walls of fungi is made of chitin. Same stuff, same stuff, right? But it means you have a host of characteristics. So lumped all together, more or less all things we consider animals have these features, and there we go, those, right? And if you say the second group is, well, at least this characteristic, first one on the page, has to do with um, all those other things, you're getting a connection here, right? You're understanding that why animals can be so different in form and in habitat is because they have that ability to form those complex structures, tissues, right? And the ability to adapt to their environment by forming these tissues that can do things like help you fly or, or swim or things like that, right? Like the millipede. Yeah, it's a millipede. Millipedes are going to have two feet every segment. Centipedes have one. Anybody know what that thing in the upper right is? One of my favorite critters. I would show you the one. Oh, hold on. Maybe I can.
Oh, Steve, there we go. Yeah, it might be deep sea. That's a good guess. A lot of them do live deep sea. They're related to these critters. I thought I had one of these, but I have its relative right there. You know, this is one of its arms is missing, but that's a brittle star related to sea stars. And as Mia pointed out, yeah, many times they are found uh, in the deep ocean, but they're they're kind of a weird looking, weird looking critter. And we'll talk more about those later. There, there's some small uh, animals, like for example, we'll look at rotifers in lab today. You may have seen rotifers in bio one underneath the pond water. You may have saw them when we did the pond water here. They're, they're microscopic. So being small doesn't make you a protozoan in this case. Rotifers aren't protozoans, they're animals. For all of these reasons that we're looking at here, there's over 8 million species of them. How many were there? flowering plants. Does anybody remember how many species of flowering plants there were? More or less. Now, if you're kind of going to make a ballpark guess, I will say one thing that we find in evolution is the more specialized organisms are, the fewer of them there are. Although I just, yeah, 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 up more, about 300,000, wasn't it? Oh, a quarter of a million. I think about a quarter of a million flowering plants were out there, so I just kind of shot myself in the foot. Well, they're a very specialized flowering plant. There you go. There's not many species of cycads around, so I'm not really totally off base. But if you would think in general that there'd be fewer species of animals and plants, you'd be right, because many animals are going to be, even the simplest animal would be a little more derived or advanced than a more complex plant. And I'm stretching that. 35 to 40 different phyla, most only found in the ocean. For example, that critter in the upper right there, uh, these critters right here, the sand dollar, the sea biscuit, all those things I don't have to point out because you live in Florida. These things uh, only found in the ocean, right? Not even found in fresh water. No. Yeah, there are no freshwater examples of these critters. It's a big group of critters that we'll talk about later called the echinoderms. Now, maybe it'd be nice if we could because it, it might help with uh, the mortality rate, but then again, animals have figured out ways around that, but we don't engage in alternation of generation. We make a lot of gametes, plenty, right? Um, and for reasons in, for example, in human reproduction, you understand why that's not the case in females. Uh, females don't make a lot of gametes, right? Uh, every month, a human uh, female, it's a human female. A human female ovulates, on average, usually one egg a month, right? That's one gamete. Now, males make lots of sperm because for reasons they have to compete with each other. There's actually a sperm wars going on, believe it or not. Sperm are mean to each other. The first group of sperm that come to the party, what they uh, actually, in many cases, die almost instantly because uh, the, the vagina is not a horribly hospitable place for foreign cells. It, it, it's got it's sort of an acidic environment to it. So it kills off a lot of those first sperm. But what that does is it neutralizes the acidity. And so those first sperm give their life for the sperm behind them. Ah, you know, it's kind of weird. But anyway, we make a lot of those males do. Females, if you think about humans, the reason why they only make one is if you ever have kids, <laughs> you realize why, what, what, what a lot of work that is. It's nice that we only have one at a time, typically. I had two kids, 18 months apart. The first was you know, my daughter, she was a typical kid. And I figured, oh, two, two kids, that's twice as hard. No, nah, it's more like 10 times as hard. <laughs> but now they're all grown, so it was worth it. We made it. Anyway, what animals typically do, it would do is we engage in sexual reproduction, where if you remember back from bio one, the big difference between that and alternation is we don't have a gametophyte. We don't have a sporal fight. We don't make spores. We go basically from the diploid individual uh, the adult, if you will, or, or even after you become a zygote, but the diploid, we go basically right into the haploid, right into making gametes. We don't make spores, which are haploid, that germinate in the, these gamete producing factories. You go inside of the diploid in our OV, uh, OVs, <laughs> ovaries and testes, we make, uh, we make, we make sperm and egg, right? And, and, and those, those are the gametes that we produce, and then they come together and make another individual. So we skip that whole gamete stage. And if you're wondering why, remember what the benefit of having a gametophyte. It's you think gamete factory. You make lots of them because most of them aren't going to make it, are they? Right? Most of them are going to die. So you're going to make a lot of them. And you're going to make a lot of offspring too. Animals, you're going to do things along the way, although it's going to look oftentimes like animals do kind of reproduce like other critters, like making a lot of offspring, like the fungi do when they make all those spores. Remember the puffball? All that gas or that 
forest going out the top. Uh, but in general, what animals do, and especially we get into some of the animals we'll talk about later on toward the end of the semester, is they uh, make fewer young, right? Fewer, but more, more uh, advanced young, more developed young. And we'll kind of go through talking about the eggs and the platypus and the, the joeys and the kangaroos and then on into like you know, the rest of us, the placental mammals. Embryonic development, that's really an important key. That is probably one of the hallmarks of being an animal is how we develop embryonically. And we'll talk about that a little bit later on. If you're wondering, are you, is that what you're looking at in that picture? It looks like a four cell stage of, a, of some sort of an animal zygote. You can see the cells stacked on each top. When a, take a look at the picture too and notice where the cells divide. They're in line with each other, aren't they? There's two different types of cleavage that occur in cells. There's that one, there's one where the top is twisted 45 degrees. We'll talk about that in a second too. One of my favorite critters was the albatross. I think because having a 10 foot wingspan, I think it'd be awesome to just kind of float on the currents. There was a, a fellow I knew who went down and did a cruise around the Antarctic when he was working for the government. He was a biologist. And uh, he said they would see these albatross that would follow along in the as the ship would sail around. It seemed to never flap their wings because they would just ride currents all day long, just jump into the water once more and get something to eat. And then, and keep going. I'm like, wow, that's a cool life. Birds are kind of neat. All right, any questions on that? I was at the San Diego Zoo one time. These people, all this group of folks were gathered around the Galapagos tortoise, and I walked up. That's Galapagos tortoise were mating. I'm like, humans. <laughs> oh, a couple summers ago, I found this really interesting paper online that I read and again bored all my friends with about what it means to be multicellular. Because to me, those little connections between what it is and what it isn't. Like the biogenesis of life have always just fascinated me, right, among other things. But in this paper I was reading, it, it said that in order to become multicellular, these four things had to have happened. Now, all four, not just a couple of them, but all four. It's kind of like the characteristics of life. Uh, these cells had to adhere or attach to one another, had to be able to communicate with one another. Then they had to be able to cooperate, and then they had to be able to specialize. So that's what's happened as we moved from being a multicellular slash tissue plant into being a true, a multicellular, really tissue, tissue, really tissue in animals. It's all of these together at a high level, uh, at, at, a, at a high degree, right? There's a, sticking together is easy enough, but communicating and communicating in sophisticated ways so you can cooperate and specialize, you can make those neuromuscular junctions. So you can uh, make the specialized cells and the brain, what, what the heck is a memory, right? How does that happen in those cells? So that, that's kind of cool stuff. Now, if we look at our buddies or our close relatives, the quinoflagellates, here's where it really, really gets cool to me. Take a look, uh, up above are is some drawings of a quinoflagellate. Quinoflagellates are protozoans, let me remind you, okay? Uh, if we look at just the morphology, just the, just the way they look, remember the first thing we talked about, First thing we talk about, why do we put critters in groups together? Because they look that way. The kitties look like the kitties and the duckies look like the duckies and so forth. We learn it when we're kids. Uh, but if we look at just the morphology uh, uh, of those coanoflagellates, there's one of them right there. And I can't see me. Can you see me moving the, the mouse? I was like, yes, yeah, stop moving it. Anyway, that's a coanoflagellate. That's a, that's a protozoan, right? And in, 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 so this is in the dark uh, image in the upper right. Uh, and then there's a bunch of them sticking together. And that's a bunch of coanoflagellates sticking together. It's not an animal, not a tissue, just a bunch of coanoflagellates. These aren't uh, animal cells. These are never going to be animal cells. No matter how much they strive and want to be an animal cell, they will not be an animal cell, right? Uh, but they sometimes stick together. Do they adhere? Yeah. Do they signal? Yeah, maybe, kind of. Do they cooperate? Well, we know evolutionary says you'd only do something because it helps. Do, do they specialize? And sometimes in organisms, they do. Certain groups of cells do certain things. But again, it's what to what degree? So that's a group of coanoflagellates. Now, down below, look at the, that's an actual microscope image of some cells that are called coanocytes. And you notice right away there's a similarity, isn't there? Coano means collar, by the way. And look at those coanoflagellates. Look at the flagella. Look at the, the collar, the little finger projections. It beats the flagella around circulating movement or, or, or allowing it to move as well as circulating food for, for feeding out of the stuff in the water, right? 
you know, all about that in the protozoans. But now we put a bunch of those things that look like coanoflagellates, coanocytes, and now with <sighs> animals. And the first group of animals we'll look at here are the sponges. And the sponges under a microscope look like a bunch of coanocyte flagellatish typish things that are hanging out together. Now, what's the difference between a individual coanoflagellate, a group of coanoflagellates, and a bunch of collar cells or coanocytes in an animal, a sponge? I leave that up to you. It's a fine line, but it involves all the degree of those four things that we talked about when we started the slide, the sticking together and communicating, cooperating, and specializing. Do sponges do that at a high degree? Well, according to Dr. Taylor, they do. They do so well, so well, right? But that's a relative term. If somebody's got their mic live, and that's okay. I don't have any problem, but I can hear you type it in the background. So... Where are we when it comes to our relationship between protozoans? Well, we're, we, us, humans, we're much further than this. But if we look at right on that line, so those rungs of Aristotle's ladder, we're right in between these two. Uh, now I want to go, hold on, I'll be right back. Nope. I'm going to continue talking about this. I was thinking about getting into the lab for a second. No, let's do that. Let's go into lab. All right, let's pull up our lab manuals. I'm gonna stop sharing this screen and then share another one. Have your lab manual open. Um, let me get over to the all right, everybody got their lab manual open? I don't have a chat box open in front of me. All right, so we're starting on exercise seven. As I said in the, um, in the email yesterday, we're not going to do all of exercise seven. We actually do exercise seven over three weeks. So. Don't worry if you're thinking, my goodness, we got a lot to go over today. We have a lot to go over, but we'll, we'll do the same amount of material that we do. Um, all right, so exercise seven, of course, involves the animals like we're talking about. And the first group that I want to look at are the peripherans. Those are the sponges. So this is in the specimens part. I like where I hold the thing. Anyway, you can see where it says peripherans. And I talk a lot about the same thing. We say that they lack true tissues, but I'll get an idea once again about what it means to be true. Now we don't have organs, right? They don't have organs. We talked about that in bio one, uh, what it means to the hierarchy, organs and the tissue. They do maybe kind of sort of have tissues. We touch an agreement they don't have organs. We'll talk a little bit about symmetry in just a second. But what I want you to first take a look at is a microscope picture of that grant you. So I'm looking at number two in the procedures under part A, examine a prepared slide of the spun grantia. So if you guys are having trouble seeing that, let me know. All right. Now, if we think about a sponge, and even though Grantia is going to be microscopic, it still allows to examine those things that are being talked about in number one above two, an X-current and an in-current openings or pores. If you remember a sponge, be right back. This is a vase sponge. If you've ever been snorkeling down the keys, you've seen these. It looks like a vase. Put roses in it, give it to your significant other. Anyway, it looks, it's called a vase sponge because it looks like a vase, right? And I'm, I'm holding it. You, you've seen these sponges before. You have, you've seen it in class, maybe. And it's got a, you know, a structure to it. It's not really tissues, but it's certainly there. And it's got some, some sort of uh, integrity, right? How do we look? Well, if we look, we're able well, to, we smell. See, it's got a lot of holes and openings. See all those? Now, there's one big opening there. The way these organisms feed is water comes in the side. Right, so they're depending on water currents. Hey, folks, somebody's got their mic live. So if you would for me, please. Lindsay, I think it might be yours. I can actually mute you, huh? Okay, well, there you go. 
you need to talk, Lindsay, let me know, no problem. I just, all right. So we're taking a look, this is the sponge. You can see up close that it's got a lot of openings to it, a lot of pores. It's, it's what we call a loose aggregate of cells. So it's not really a tissue. It's like a, a, a bunch of cells hanging out together. Kind of so kind of coagulate, but a little bit more. Again, if you, if you allow me to kind of go between the ladders of Aristotle. Now this one illustrates the incurrent and the excurrent siphons really, really well. If you just remember how I said these organisms live, they're, they're filter feeders. So water moves in through the side, out through the top. So this is the, this is the incurrent openings. This is the S, uh, excurrent openings. And do I want you to know what an osculum is? Yeah, there it is. It's also known, this thing right here, as an osculum. Water in the side, water in the side, water out the top. Uh, a water as it goes through, goes through all these little canals and openings, see them? Oh, geez. Yeah, see those? See all those openings? Water goes into all those openings and it comes out through the top and as it does, those colonoflagellates, if we could look at this microscopically, and we'll look at that in Granchi in a minute, they're beating their little flagella and they're moving water through in and out through the top and they're filtering food. There's collars are trapping food. You've seen this before. There was a protozoan. What protozoan does that? I think they have the chat thing up. Yeah, there we go. What protozoan we looked at, it doesn't use its flagella for getting around, but uses it for moving the water around to capture food. Just to show through it. Yeah, there you go. We're to sell it. Not really, you can't, can you? Oh, man. That'd be cool. Sorry if I'm blinding everybody. But anyway, you all know what I'm trying to illustrate there. Now, let's take a look at Grantia. Grantia is a, um, is a freshwater sponge. Most sponges are in the marine. When we say marine in biology, we're talking about uh, saltwater, typically. Grantia is an example of a freshwater sponge, and although there are a lot of those. Turn that light before I feel like I need to confess something. Um, so let me pull up the image of Grantia. Now this is the slide you would have saw in class. Is the camera on? I'm gonna switch cameras and you're gonna be looking at the microscope image. You are looking live. Oh crap, hold on. Sorry about that folks, in one second I forgot I that other slide is people were entering the room today. Look at that. See how quick Mr. Clark can find this. There we go. It's on the screen. Oh, that's not bad. Oh, wait, let me focus out a little bit. I got to reach across. So now you won't be able to see me, but you'll hear my voice. Lucky game for you. Come on, guys. Come on. Oh, there we go. Ah, beautiful, beautiful. All right, now I'm gonna try to move this thing. And remember, I'm trying to move it watching the screen. And uh, so don't look at this if you get motion sickness. I made myself motion sickness. A little smaller, hold on one second. Uh, I'll use it as a way to shrink that. Yes, do it that way. Help much, did it? Okay, so the cells or the organism, again, not really tissues, are stained purple. And so the outside or the part that where the water comes in through would be this part up near the top where you, in the upper right, where you see the line. Again, maybe you can see my mouse. I don't know if you can, but I'm kind of moving it down that line to the upper right. You can see where there's something, a bunch of cells and there's not a bunch. But notice in between those cells, all of those um, in-current openings, right? And think of those as the canals down around Port Charlotte where all, everybody's got a canal, a, a home on a canal. All of those are waterways and those coanoflagellates, whoops, those coanocytes, now the coanocytes, are beating the little flagella, making water move through so they can capture water by their collars. And water is moving from the upper right in that picture down to the lower left. And uh, on 4X. let me show you. As it moves down to the left, It comes into this opening. Let me show you, this is an opening, right? Because on the other side is lying. Hmm. Oh, that was the opening. <laughs> Excuse me, got my slide backwards. There we go. Now, 
In the upper right is the outside of the cell. There's the outside of the cell. It's the dark margin that lines the inside. So that's the osculum. That's the excurrent siphon. Remember the vase sponge I showed you. That's the opening. And then here's the other side. So I had those backwards. Pardon me. Looking at one thing and talking about another. It's really hard for me to do in normal days. All right, so water's moving in, in this case, from the lower left, through all those little Port Charlotte canals and those clinoflagellates. There we go, our beating, 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 water's moving through, moving through, coming into the, uh, in the, the osculum, that gap in the middle, and then it's gonna be out through the top, and the top is gonna be up here. Oh, looks like the bottom. The way they do these things are really small is they cut them, like if you cut them long ways. You think about trying to slice a cucumber long ways. Oh, so here's what happened. Since they're trying to cut it long ways, I'm gonna switch off of that for a second. I'll come back to it so you guys can finish any. Uh, all right, so what happens in that case, the reason why that doesn't look like it's a vase, it, it really is. Let me see if I can do this at all. So. I'm gonna make it really big. So there it is, there's a vase. So there's the bottom, right? Water coming into the side and out to the top. What they did is when they took that particular section that you're looking at, they try to slice it right down the middle. Wouldn't that be great, right? So you can see that there's an opening at the top, but they missed. So they didn't quite get an opening. So what they have is basically if you took a tube and you sliced it, that way, kind of, you get the whole tube, right? So that's why it looks that way. You only got a section. That's why there's two bottoms, too. It's not two bottoms. But. There are some ones in the slide collection that do show the opening, but I'm not going to run and find those. I think you guys understand what I'm saying here. Let's go back to that picture, talk about that for a second. Again, give me some feedback. Are you guys seeing uh, what I'm trying to talk about? Does that make sense? Do I need to adjust the image anyways? Now, you can find all these on Google. Same exact images. All you do is type in, what is this, Grantia? Yeah, G-R-A-N-T-I-A. What I'm trying to get you guys to, to sort of take home message with this. Is it, it looks like what it is, right? It's a loose aggregate of cells. And that word aggregate is a little bit tough, but you know, we talked about that. Where does it become a bunch of cells hanging out and then a tissue? These are, these are not really defined as tissues, but they're a little bit more than just being a little being multicellular. That's why they're the first group in the, in the animal group, all lined with colonocytes, which are pretty much like colonoflagellates. Hmm. I wonder if that's a coincidence. So how would you describe the arrangement of cells? Somebody give me a little blurb. Maybe just a half dozen words will do it. Is that loose? Yeah. Yeah, loose collection, right? So does it look like does it look like definitive tissues here? And I want to hear something a little bit more than maybe derivative than something I've told you. What do you what do you think in terms of your opinions of what we talk about what makes a tissue? Is what they're doing highly specialized? Those Coanocytes. I mean, there are other cells and peripherans that we'll get to back into lecture in just a second, but does it really look like we get a lot of specialized going on there? I'm leading the witness here maybe a little bit. It looked like it, uh, very, it's not very dense at the cell wall. So I guess, I don't know if that means it creates more space for the water to go through or... Sure. But I mean, if you think about a you know, basically these organisms are doing kind of what vorticella did, but they're doing in a group with a little bit more cooperation and adherence and all those things we looked at. But, you know, I, I, I think we could make a, a reasonable argument that that's probably not what we think of when we think of specialized definitive tissue. So while it may be tissue adjacent, not exactly tissue, right? I'm hoping if nothing else throughout the semester, you guys have gotten a real appreciation for the nuances in science and how so many times you have to be careful about the way something is written. So, you know, your argument about whether you think that's tissue or not, that's something that's based on what you've hopefully absorbed from what I've been talking about. 
I think uh, if I was going to describe this, I'd probably use the typical science response of saying they have characteristics of both. And so they are really kind of go against Aristotle, kind of really straddle the line there. But do they do what they need to do well? Is, is this, a, all right, is this an efficient way to be a living organism, what you see here today? This physical structure, this sort of life that they live, is that an efficient way to live? You're thinking, what do you mean by efficiency? Remember, when we talk about evolution, there's really only one measure of efficiency. Oh, I guess I should get the box here. Hello? I think that's a pretty good answer. What do you all think about Ian's answer that each species has their own way? Are there some species more efficient than others? Oh, that's a good question. Are there some species that are more efficient overall than others? Are birds more efficient than reptiles? Are mammals more efficient than, than birds? So when you say some live for a long time and some die off, are you talking about numbers or, 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 or different types of species? So again, reptiles and birds, are we separating at that level? I mean, Taylor, you got the right idea, right? About evolution, natural selection, but I'm wondering. That's a good answer. It ties together exactly what we've been talking about all along. It kind of ties in what my uh, what my uh, Kentucky uh, uh, Zoe professor uh, taught me so well, right? They do so well with so little. They do so well. It's there. Yeah, the idea of these organisms, these organisms survive are clearly Darwinian, right? The fact that they survived this long, they, and they were around long before we were, obviously, us humans, and they've been doing this for a long Now, not all of them. Many of them have gone extinct. Probably most of them. But the ones that are still around today are descendants of those. So living your life as a sponge, if you say, wow, that can't be good. Well, it's pretty doggone good because they do so well with so little. One of the things you're going to need, and I, I wish there was some way to me uh, to virtually have you feel a sponge, but if you <laughs> got one in the bathroom, which is probably a fake one, you can do this. Let me go back to, uh, no, I'm going to leave it on the slides. Uh, when we feel a sponge, is there is a, uh, there are some, they're, they're rough. They're, 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 you know, they're, they're, Anyway, some are rougher than others. There's some that actually uh, have glass uh, um, embedded in them. They're glass sponges, and they are really, they really are, are, are rough. You really can feel the, the, the granulation of the glass. I want to show you of what makes these things rough under the microscope in a second. Again, another slide that you would have seen here in class, but these are things that we call spicules. Give me one second to get those in. I'm on number three here. These are really cool because if you're into sponges and you decide you want to be a peripherologist or study sponges, one of the things you'll learn is how to identify sponges by their spicules. You'll see what I mean by identify them. Oops. Yeah, right. you see what I mean in just a second about identifying by their spicules. Spicules are one of those things if you do a Google search for images, you can just kind of get lost in these. Let me see. because it's diversity, man. It's really, really incredible. Well, this is focused. Oh, there they are, there's some. See, those little shard things, those are spicules, and they have different shapes to them. And sometimes they're made of calcium carbonate, right? CaCO3, calcium carbonate, which is very common in organisms in the ocean. We, you know, for example, when we talk about um, Clams, oysters, their shells are made of this. I can find another. And sometimes that, that one looks like it's broke because you see those spicules of that shape are in a tetrahedron. There they go. Look at that one. Isn't that cool? And sometimes they're made of glass, you know, silicon. So that's the ones that are in the glass sponges. See that? Isn't it amazing how Mother Nature comes up with this incredible arrangement of the most structurally sound, because that's what these things are. These things are embedded in the sponge. They're embedded in this, this uh, gelatinous matrix that we'll look at in just a second. But these things are embedded, and they're made of gl glass or calcium carbonate. What are they made of? They're hard, right? So they provide kind of a skeleton in function. They provide some rigidity. They're kind of like the cell walls 
uh, when it comes to plant cells or, or any other thing that uses cell walls like in the fungi. Those neat. And what I mean by being able to tell the difference is like these have a particular shape, they're sort of in a tetrahedron. Some of them are, are, are just like the, the one over on the left, like the straight ones. Uh, different sponges have different shaped uh, spicules in different groups. So if you're into sponges, this is your, this is your life. Kind okay, of cool though. So anyway, as we said, calcium carbonate and silicon provide structural support. So make a sketch of a couple of those just so you remind yourself of what they look like or, or make a note where you uh, can find these. You can find them on Google or, or anywhere. And this is also being recorded, hopefully. Yes, in case it still is. Now, uh, the question down below that is you're thinking and drawing out your spongules. Oh, lo no, loofahs, oh, good question, sorry. Loofahs are um, a plant, right? It's some tropical plant that they cut and it dries, and that's the cellulose matrix of that. That's, I know, because they look like sponges, don't they? But you remember the way they're cut, they almost, like, they almost look like a plant, like they have those big canals inside. I'll say. If you think about, yeah, if you think about structural rigidity, and, and again, I don't know, I'm not up on my loofah life history, but I'm thinking they're, they're vines. If I remember, big vines that grow in the tropical region, so they need a lot of that strength to be able to grow as a vine. You know, you don't have bark and all that stuff. But is that what they are? Oh, yeah, it makes sense. Because they kind of look like that when you look at the seeds on the inside. So they don't grow as a, maybe as a ground vine, because that's how cucumber grows. Doesn't cucumber grow along the ground? It does. Look at me. Apparently, Mr. Clark, not much of a farmer. Now, a lot of the sponges we went just a second ago. <laughs> now it's just like me. Well, I grew a bunch of tomatoes one time, but the doggone neighborhood squirrels kept having a feast. I'm like, I like you guys, but I'm not going to feed you. Um, all right, down below in the question, there was something I was going to ask, but it'll come back to me in a second because I'm thinking about this as well. I, I'd like to be able to think that you guys could look at that and almost instantaneously come up with an answer, maybe by uh, one word, uh, one word, one word, technically. Why don't you guys look at that for a second? So animals and sponges have to get food and nutrients, get rid of waste, blah, blah. all the stuff you heard about why cells stay small when you're in bio one, but what's the, what's the process or processes by which they do that? And then you'll think, oh, that's why they're so like a loose aggregate too. You can see me. Ah, oh, there I am. Oh, nobody's, nobody's answering there. I remember I got to turn on the chat box. Oh, wait, none of you are answering. So what do you think? What? I gave you three uh, uh, lines there. You could go on and talk about it in very detail, but I'm thinking if you could just at least identify for me, you probably have the, the sufficient knowledge to describe it in detail. What's the one or two processes, depending on how technical you get, by which organisms in general, whether we're talking about sponges, animals, or even plants, uh, do this kind of stuff? How do they, how do they absorb food and distribute those nutrients and get rid of waste and all that sort of stuff? As if you came in class today and you realized that even though it looks like, like maybe Mr. Clark didn't shower, you might notice right away because you would notice something, you might smell something. How did that end up being over there by you? Sure. Yeah, it's by diffusion, right? Diffusion, and if we're being real technical, if we're talking about water in this case, then the osmosis. But remember, osmosis is a type of diffusion. So if you were just thinking diffusion, you would have been, you would have been correct. If maybe somebody had asked you, you know, specifically water, then you would have wanted to make sure and qualify that by talking about osmosis. Okay. Let me go on back in the lecture. If, any, the, if none of you have any questions about this part of the lab, I do want to get into the, uh, the, the advanced part. I want to talk about the animals and then into the different groups. So if everybody's good with what we've done up in part A, we'll go back to lecture. I remember if you need to take a break, because this is going to you know, go on for a little bit, you're more than welcome to. This is being recorded, so you can come back and check on it then. Sometimes the answers to things are, you know, if you go back to some of the basic stuff you learned in Bio 1, I mean, diffusion osmosis, all that stuff is 
So if you should be very familiar with it, I'm sure you are. This is kind of cool to me because I like the pictures. It reminds me of fruit strike gum, that, that sort of hypothetical critter on the right-hand side. We'll talk in a second about what the colors mean. One of the things that we talk about in animals is this specialty of movement, complex movement, not just kind of, you know, more than the jellyfish again, but not just basically turning toward the sun or growing across your bread if you're a bread mold or something like that, but something that involves a, you know, a walking and a running and a flying, which is cool, just so cool. Um, it, uh, among animals is this sense to do that. And the reason why we do it is genetic, right? Animals have these things, uh, and fungus do, and then plants do, they have these things called homeotic genes. And what homeotic genes are genes that control where you put things. That makes sense. Where do I put the fruiting bodies if I'm talking about a, a club fungi? Or, or, you know, where do I put the flowers if I'm talking about a flowering plant or the cones? I mean, where do I put the branches? I mean, it's important to know where all those parts are you know, for us, where do I put the arms? It's better to put the arms, if you've got armed critters up higher and the legs down lower and the head should be here. And you'll notice that there seems to be one kind of common trend that all critters came up with. The head's in the front for reasons we'll talk about. The arms and the legs are appendages that come out. The legs usually don't have an arm and then a leg. You usually have, you know, one on the kind of in pairs on the opposite sides of your body. It's important, then, isn't it? Especially if you want to be incapable of complex movement. Can you imagine if somehow we evolved so that our feet were facing opposite every time we walk, we'd just kind of go in a circle, wouldn't we? That wouldn't be, might make much sense. Within these homeotic genes, this is where it gets really, really cool because we find out that genes control each other and they work together in these uh, 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 like concerts, okay? Within these genes or these, among these homeotic genes, there are sequences of them we call homeoboxes. And I'm not really sure. I have to talk to my. Uh, uh, genetics buddy about word box, but I like to think of homeoboxes as being a box, a collection of these genes. Simple for all I know. Within animals, remember these homeotic genes occur among all critters, but within animals, these home, we have a homeobox called, called the Hox gene. So it's genes. It's a collection of genes that work together in concert to tell us where to put our, 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 our body parts and, 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 and when to grow them and stop growing them. So if I'm growing an arm, how far out do I grow the arm and a leg? And if I'm a fish, and how far do I grow the fin? And if I'm a bird, the wing and all those things that animals use, that's all gonna be controlled by that. Now, of course, we know what genes do is genes do what genes do. They change, they mutate, they do that by themselves. They do it, uh, if you will, when crossing over occurs, mutating genes being that you're changing them. And that's what genes do. We, very witness of that with the virus going on. What do viruses do is they mutate. They mutate into pathogenicity, causing a disease, and back out of it again. That's why these things ebb and flow the way they do. Just gotta make sure we keep as many people infected as we possibly can, and that's why we do these kinds of things. If we move those genes around, make changes that you learned about in bio one, like duplicating them, or shuffling them, or inverting them, we're usually, before I go on to the rest of that sentence, I'm gonna help you guys help me out for a second. When we change genes, move them around, shuffle them, duplicate them, do all those things you learn about in bio one, what typically happens to the critter that that happens to? What usually does that result in when we move those genes around? When we uh, fool with mother nature. Okay, that's a good word, but mutations, uh, you know, now that we've been in biology a while, we know that mutations can be of two types. So what type? Of mutations would those uh, genes that change usually result in bad or or good? I'm glasses off and see. Diversity is another one that would be good mutations. But what do they usually? What do these mutations usually? If you go in and start messing with Mother Nature down there at the very basic level of the genetic information, what usually happens? My mother would say, "Don't poke the devil with a short stick." Bad. Yep. Usually it's bad. It's death. Right. Usually when you mess with that genetic information, what happens is you kill the organism or you remove its. Uh, not remove it, lower its fitness. That's not a good thing. Is it, you guys were thinking the right way when you answered initially, is it always bad? Nope. Actually, it's always, or not always, it's mostly silent. Because remember, if you're a eukaryotic critter, you have those uh, intervals, those introns. But if it happens to the exons, it's usually bad, but not always, not always, not always is it bad. If those genes shuffled and were duplicated and moved throughout uh, billions of years of evolution, or at least hundreds of thousands of years when it comes to the animals, what you basically are going to get is some beneficial mutations that occur that allow organisms to put those 
body parts in the right place with the right size and with the right shape in the most efficient manner. And that's gonna happen through, how does that happen? How's that most efficient, well, how's that most fit manner of where to put the body parts gonna come out? How come we don't have a, a leg and an arm and then you know, kind of the opposite on the other side? Wouldn't that be a good idea? Yeah, sure. Adaptation, natural selection. What's the most fittest? It's it's not most fit to have an arm and then a leg. It's most fit to have arms up here and legs down there. Or like Cooper went out for a run the other day. He always beats me when he likes to race. I'm like, remember, dude, you got four legs compared to my two. That's not really fair. Now, if we learn to uh, if we learn to put these genes in the right order, and we learn to regulate them, and and all this happens through chance randomization of evolution and fitness and everything that Darwin told us about we get diversity. And so what we are looking at in the fruit stripe picture, finally, and I'm getting, I love, I don't like gum. I love fruit stripe gum. If we think about some early uh, segmented critter, now that's an important thing about animals that we'll talk about. And animals exhibit a trait called segmentation. Some, some do, many do, we do. I'll talk more about that. Obviously you can see what I mean here by segments. There's thoracic or chest, if you will, segments, the genital segments, the abdominal segments. And that critter up above is a fictitious critter, doesn't, doesn't exist, but we're thinking of it as an ancestor. And the one down below does, it's a grasshopper. What is trying to be illustrated in this picture, and it's a similar illustration on the left-hand side between the, 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 the adult uh, and the mouse embryo with the colors, is the position of these genes that controlled where these body parts went. For the, initially in the ancestor, the fruit stripe gum one, uh, they were kind of mixed throughout. So it's all the multicolor. So what you got is basically a repeat of the same kind of segment. Da, 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 da. Legs, making legs, making legs, making legs, making legs. It made 12, 12 segments of legs. And then you had one that made some genital segments and then he had abdomen made some abdominal segments. So you didn't get, a, you got diversity there. Don't get me wrong, but you didn't get a lot of it. You know, it's kind of like a, a, a train with all the same kind of train car behind it. It's all got the, the fuel truck on it. As a kid, I'd love that one, right? I don't remember what it was. But anyway, you had a bunch of those. There's not much diversity there. So now, does that still exist? Yeah, there's some critters out there that are kind of that way. If you're thinking millipedes and centipedes, you're, you're wrong. They, 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 they're not that way because of this. But what we see in most of the critters that are segmented with specialized, now we're going beyond tissue, specialized body parts like the grasshopper, is these genes begin to separate out. So the, what, the colors, represent, the, they're the, there's the names and the legends of the names of the genes, but they begin to separate out and you, now you have different parts of the segmented organism that specialized. So not shown in the picture really, but you have the head segments and they do head things, all their organs are. Uh, you have the walking in, in, in like legged insects and such. You have the walking segments, which is where the thorax is going to be. Then you might even in the thorax have a, another part of that that's been specialized into jumping segments because grasshopper, grasshoppers jump for reasons I'm sure that makes sense. They, you know, they can get away from stuff. And then you have abdominal segments and then you have genital segments. So what we've done, what we think has occurred in evolution is these genes were shuffled and selected throughout time. Those genes, instead of going leg, 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 which fine, kind of boring, right? But we're gonna go, walking leg, jumping leg, and, and, and when we get into the crayfish, uh, next week, a week after, anyway, when we get into the crayfish and in the lab, you're gonna see that they've taken a bunch of leg appendages, the antenna of a crayfish, appendage, the little mouth parts, appendages, the legs, appendages, they're all modified appendages, that's the big thing, and homeotic genes, and especially the uh, Cox genes in animals allow us to do that. Oh, God, I feel like I'm, asking, but I, I still, it's so important to me that you guys understand this because it speaks to how much you remember about organisms being related. But if we notice between the mouse embryo and the adult human, the colors represent the, what these Hox genes control. So the blue genes, Hox A, B, C, and D, blue colored or blue, shade of blue, they control the thoracic uh, parts and the ones that are green control the appendages and so on. And they're found in similar positions when we look at the mouse. And I write down below. So there's a homology between where those Hox genes are in mice and where they're on humans and what they control. And in red, hopefully ask a very obvious question. Obviously mice and humans are kind of related, right? So I guess I could expand upon that. So the evolution of where body parts go, this whole thing we're talking about, did it happen before or after humans and mice had a common ancestor? 
So this specialization of where you put body parts, was that in the ancestor to mice and humans or did it happen in both of us afterwards? Mice in one part, humans in the other. What do you all think? <laughs> Hedging your bets, Ian. Now, if you're thinking, do I have the right answer? You do, because both answers can be right. One's a little more parsimonious than the other. Since this is rather specialized, this whole placement of genes, we would think that what are the odds that these two organisms, mice and humans, develop this stability through evolution and everything we've been talking about, came up with the same answer the same way? It could happen. It's kind of like photosynthesis. You remember talking about that? That happened before organisms split and became plants that photosynthesized and protozoans that photosynthesized before. Well, protozoans look different, but still. Anytime we see something like this that is complexity, we generally go parsimoniously and say it was most likely a common ancestor that had these, these genes in that position. And that from that common ancestor, the mouse uh, and the adult lineage diverged. All right, rather than the other way around. To think that this complex system would have developed in both mice and humans independently, so a convergent evolution uh, uh, kind of thing would have, uh, would have, been, would have been pushing uh, parsimony in that case. So what that shows here is that these organisms probably had a common ancestor, recent common ancestor, most likely. I don't know, because I wasn't there to see it happen. None of us were. Oh yeah, this is cool. This is, it has to do with embryonic development. So, um, I'll get to those terms in the, in the brown in just a second. First, we start off as, as, as a zygote. Oops. Lost my webcam for some reason. Oh, there it is. I just moved something in front of it. Just want to make sure. So first, we start off with a zygote. Anybody remember what a zygote is? What's the definition of a zygote? From bio one. It's a good place to pick up because this is where bio one stuff. Who was a zygote? Raise your hand. I can't see it, but maybe you can raise your hand virtually. We even saw that word when we were talking about alternation of generation, right? The sporal fight coming out came out from the cell. Yeah, okay. So it's a fertilized cell, right? A zygote is when the sperm and the egg come together. Before that, you're independent gametes. You're not a diploid, you're a haploid. But the first diploid thing you become is a zygote. That's where homozygous and heterozygous come from. But then they start dividing and you're still going to go cleavage and you form up, two, one becomes two and two become four and four become eight and they start piling up into a ball and you eventually come up to an eight cell stage for reasons that should be obvious and that continues to grow. But you don't, you don't continue to form a mass of cells. There's another stage in here and it comes from a really cool Latin word that means grapes. I know you think, oh, Staphyla, well, this is another one for it. I didn't think about that until I just said that. But um, as that ball of cell grows, after it's a zygote and an eight cell and so forth, it forms a morula. And a morula is a, is a ball of cells, right? It's like a group of grapes, it's a ball of cells, M-O-R-U-L-A. After a morula forms, then uh, what you get is what we call a blastula, and a blastula has a blastocele. C-O-E-L means space, okay? So in a blastula, which is a ball of cells, there now is an open space. So this is gonna be right before a morula, because a morula doesn't have that blastocele. If you're wondering why are you, I'll leave, it seems like such gyrations, look what happens next, this is so cool. In red, what happens next is, next is one part of that, um, think about a balloon, right? the blastula with the blastocele, one part of that begins to pinch in, like if you were to push your finger into a balloon. And as you do that, you're undergoing the process of what we call gastrulation. Now, it, when I was going through Zoe and looking at this, it was hard for me to get a mental image, but what you're looking at is the ball of cells. Now, if we took that ball of cells and rotated it so that part that's being pinched in was facing you, what you would end up looking at is a ball of cells, right? With a pit. 
this pit is, is th that's that yellow part that you see in there. And if you continued to push all the way through to the other side, you would actually form a tube, wouldn't you? So first, this has got a, a, a block end to it because you haven't gone all the way through, like in the picture you see there. And eventually what that would do is grow through to the other side. So now you would have open space out here and open space in here, you have a tube. Now in zoology, we have a term for that. We say that there are certain organisms out there, which we'll talk about, but they basically have a tube within a tube body plan because they are basically just that. There are tube running through a tube. Now this is the digestion and this is the rest of the critter. And this is the outside. No idea how well this is translating for a lot of this. Yeah, way steep. There you go. Oh. All right. So now a tube within a tube body plan in an animal is a little bit different than what I'm talking about going on here. But I want you to kind of get a visual of what's going on. So this part that's in the yellow there, now that part that's being pinched in, we have a name for it now. It's called a blastopore. It's a, the pore, the opening that's being pushed through that middle of the cells. Um, as that pushes through the other side, it's going to create a, a couple of things that are going to be important to us later on. It's going to create some tissue on the inside. Uh, let me not call it tissues. Groups of cells that are going to become tissues better. It, it, it's got some cells on the inside in the yellow that are going to be the endoderm. It's got some cells on the outside that are in blue going to be the ectoderm. And actually not in the picture here, but in between is going to be some cells in between known as the mesoderm. And we'll get to a slide in just a second. I'll, show you, I'll tell you what I mean about those being important. But those different cell types, right, those different types of cells are going to lend themselves to all the diversity that we see in animals on the planet. So it's, it's, it starts right back at this level. Isn't that kind of cool? So any questions about what we're doing there? So if you're wondering, the part that's the blastocele, eventually when that yellow part pushes its way all the way through, what we're going to have in that blastocele is gonna be the, um, uh, the guts of the organism, right? The, the other part. So yourself, uh, you, the yellow part is, is gonna be the tube that forms your digestive system and all the other stuff comes out of that and forms in the blastocele. Then blue, yeah, thanks. I remember he's black. I think I'll just stick with one color. A couple of terms up above, just as we go through and talking about different animals, so we make sure we understand. Uh, when we talk about something being a larval stage or a larvae, it's sexually immature. And what's important about that is what we see in evolution. God, this is so incredible too. Uh, among larvae and adults of the same species who live in the same environment, who sh you know may, uh, compete with one another, right? That's why you want to disperse your young. But one of the things you might be able to do, think caterpillar and butterfly, is if the larval form I eat something different than the adult form, then you have resource partitioning. So one eats the leaves and the other eats the stems or something like that. So you can both live in the same place because you're not competing with the adults and the adults are not competing with you. That's kind of cool. A lot of species of lizards do that too. They'll live in different parts of the tree, up above or down below, uh, you know, higher up the tree or lower down, and they'll eat different things. Many organisms go through a, a, a transformation, and this kind of fits in with that larva idea again. And, and there's a nice picture of a, of a butterfly showing you. So we get the caterpillar at the beginning, and then we get something totally different at the end. Or in some insects, like with the, with the, with the uh, grasshopper, uh, the difference between an adult and a, and a, and a smaller grasshoppers size, that's all. They still look like a grasshopper. We have names for that. If uh, you do this complete transformation, like the butterfly, it's called complete metamorphosis. And if it's uh, like the grasshopper, we call it incomplete. Down below is our friend, the butterfly. The butterfly. Down below is our friend, the mosquito. Not our friend at all. What kind of uh, metamorphosis does the mosquito undergo during its life cycle? Absolutely. Now, if you look at the larvae, can I draw this? Yeah, right there. Check it out. If you look right about here in the blue, that's what we call an air tube. So the larvae of the insect floats just below the surface of the water. And this little tiny air tube that uh, goes up the top and allows gas exchange to occur. Now, years ago, and they, you shouldn't do this now because it's bad for the environment, but years ago, one of the things that 
folks use to get rid of the mosquitoes was putting oil on the top. So they put a layer of oil over top of the water in which the mosquitoes would breed and that would kill the mosquitoes. Do you understand how that, how that worked now? Obviously it doesn't kill enough of them. Yeah, the oil causes other damage to the environment, not to mention all the uh, nasty pollutants that are in the oil that get into the waterways and into the fish. But do you understand how that kills the mosquito or how that uh, mitigates mosquitoes or at least lowers their numbers? Does anybody not? It suffocates them, doesn't it? Not a good thing to do. Yeah, there you go. You can see where the, you can see where the, uh, kind of the idea behind it. One second, folks, let me. Oh, there we go. So I gotta clear my drawings. All right, so we talked about general features in animals. What I want to talk about now are still kind of general features, but in animals they are. But I mean, amongst animals, they're a little more specialized about what it means to be an animal. Like for example, symmetry, talk a little bit about tissues, and we're going to talk about how those body cavities are going to form, and those are going to be important. That's where those endoderm and, and ectoderm and mesoderm, that's where that's going to come into play. It's body cavities where all those other parts of your body are going to form, so that's important. A circulatory system, there are two types of them out there. This is the system that carries around, you know, oxygen, blood, uh, immune system, nutrients, waste products, all that sort of stuff. Among animals, we have one like ours, which is a heart. We have uh, arteries that lead away from the heart. Think about that for a second, maybe we'll also start talking A&P. We got veins that come back to the heart, and there's a connection between the arteries and the veins at the most microscopic level or what is it called, the arterioles and the venials or something like that, where they come together. But there's never a spot where they don't come together unless there's a wound, right? So those tubes connect together. Artery, vein, they always connect together. That's a closed circulatory system, isn't it? It's all connected. I didn't do my other fingers, but I can't. My finger made that way. But that's a closed circulatory system. Other organisms like clams, uh, and oysters and, and, and the crayfish have an open circulatory system. Uh, did I say crayfish? No, I didn't mean to say crayfish. I'm drawing a blank on that. Uh, certainly clams have, a, have an open circulatory system, and we'll talk about that in a second, but the thing with, uh, or a little bit later on, the thing with the open circulatory system is the arteries dump blood into a space where all of the organs are found. And then the veins pump that blood away. So basically your organs in, a, in an open circulatory system, they kind of float in this pool of, of blood, if you will. It's not necessarily blood, it's, it has other functions to it. But, so that's the difference between those two. Embryonic development, we touched on that a little bit. That's, we'll talk about that in a little more detail. And again, coming back to this idea of what it means to be uh, segmented. Segmented is specialization. You can be specialized when you're segmented. Symmetry, what does it mean to have symmetry? Well, if you're an animal, it means you know which direction you're going in. And it kind of depends, of course, on what animal you are. Because some animals, like the anemone, that's what you look at in the upper left, that's an anemone. Those organisms have what we call radial symmetry, which means if you take a line and cut right through the middle, like in the black lines, you get equal halves. It's a circle, they're a circle. You're generally gonna find these in sessile critters or those that are planktonic, because planktonic, that's an interesting word, actually. Planktonic, I think I mentioned to you guys before, but it's where bears repeating. Planktonic means more of a lifestyle than what kind of critter you are. There are lots of things that are planktonic. If you go to the beach and float in the ocean, just float, you're kind of being planktonic, really. Planktonic means to float. Organisms that float do so based on the currents, and they can do it randomly. They don't really have much control over it. Even some that kind of move around, like the jellyfish that bloop a little bit, they still are kind of at the whims of the currents and they kind of float around. And it's okay to be this kind of symmetry if you don't really care what direction you're going in. Because if you're round, there's no left, right, or anything like that at all, is there? You're round. 
So a sea anemone doesn't really care. Sea anemones do move along the bottom a little bit. Jellyfish, a lot of other critters that we'll look at, and they have this radial symmetry because while they move in a particular direction, while they may even can kind of move themselves in a particular direction, they really just move in a direction. And they're more liable to be either planktonic or don't move at all, or sessile. Now, don't confuse that with sponges, because some sponges, like vase sponges, like this pretty one here in the, in the yellow, they look like they have radial symmetry, but we say in sponges in general, they have, they're asymmetric, because there's many cases of them just looking like blobs. They just grow this way, not because of any particular symmetry, just because of, uh, well, you know why, because of evolution. So the peripherans are asymmetrical. The rest of us, on the other hand, well, those critters of us that aren't radial symmetrical, we do, we do have a left left and a right. We do have a top and a bottom. We have a dorsal and a ventral. This is my dorsal. This is my ventral. If you take an AMP, you learn all this kind of stuff. Uh, so you look down at the sea turtle at the bottom, bilateral symmetry. That's what we mean by two sides, left and right, top and bottom. So now you have an anterior and a posterior, and that's really important too. Not only knowing your left from your right and your top from your bottom, but Having a front and a back is important because by definition, if you're moving, you're probably moving towards the front. Cars usually drive in that direction towards the front. If not, why not put the headlights on the back? Okay, same kind of idea with an animal though. In bilaterally symmetrical animals, the advantage you get out of being that way is you put all the important things up front. It's called cephalization. Up in the front is where your brain is. Up in the front is where your eyes are and your ears, and your nose. And if you got whiskers, it's where those are. Anybody have any ideas to why that's an advantage for bilaterally symmetrical animals to have the head up front? Why not have the head and back? A friend of mine said that's what goats are because their knees bend backwards, their head's on the wrong side. No, but generally, why would you think it would be advantageous to have your head at the front? It, when I say front, I'm talking about that's the direction you're generally going to move in. Like that sea turtle is going to swim probably towards its head. You have your head in the front if we're walking on all fours. Well, yeah, enhances, right? Enhances the senses and it also puts them in the right spot. Think about this for a second. Spend a day. Can't do it now because... Walk around your house. Walk around your house backwards all day long. Just walk around your house backwards. You know your house pretty well, but what are your odds of running into stuff? Makes sense to have in, I guess I should qualify this, do it on all fours. Now turn around the other way and do it on all fours with your head facing forward. You'll probably run into a lot fewer things, right? Thinking. It makes sense to put all your sense organs up front because that's the first, first part of your environment that comes, that's the first part of the organism that comes into contact with the environment. They're looking forward. If I'm looking for danger, I'm probably going to be looking forward forward. If I'm, it, it, it doesn't make any sense to put the eyes in the back after I've walked by the tiger that's laying off in the, in the brush getting ready to jump on me. Whoops. Kind of like the, coming across the bear tracks in the woods and these two fellows like, I tell you what, you go see where the bear is going and I'll see where it came from. You know, it's like, doesn't make much sense you know, once you see the danger, once you've gone by it. Yeah, absolutely. You're going to respond to, so that's an advantage, isn't it? Now that's an advantage only if you're bilateral. It's an advantage if you need to know where you're going and you need to pay attention to those things. So if you're radial, like the sea anemone, jellyfish and all that stuff, yeah, I don't have a lot of sense organs or really don't really have any, honestly. You're just kind of floating along. You're planktonic. So if you're bilateral, you're generally going to be capable of mobility, right? And usually when we say mobility, again, it's not random. Mobility is going to be consistency of direction. The turtle wants to move forward, then it wants to move left, then it turns around. It doesn't just kind of float wherever the current's taking it, even if you're blooming around like the jellyfish do. What's kind of weird, though, is when we take a look at the sea star, this is the Florida sea star, by the way, Florida species. These are the group we looked at earlier. These are the echinoderms. They have both radial and bilateral symmetry. They have radial symmetry here because... Nice job, Steve. <laughs> you, can draw, <laughs> you can draw a line through all the X's there, or all the arms, and, and that's radial symmetry. But when they're younger, as a larva, they actually have bilateral. But we'll talk about that a little bit later on. Tissues and body cavities. We got a little bit of time. 
Okay, so here's where uh, animals really sort of show their hallmark of tissues. The animal zygote is, is a word that we hear perhaps sometimes, not this one in particular so much, but it's called totipotent. I know you want to say totipotent, but it's totipotent, right? The part in red. Totipotent means that the animal zygote, so there it is, the oocyte, and of course the sperm fertilizes, and then the zygote, right? Uh, the animal zygote cell is totipotent. It means that one cell can divide into and make any type of cell. When we say any type of cell, we're kind of moving into tissues here. It can make cardiac cells, it can make nervous cells, it can make muscular cells, skin cells, all these cells that, that us animals have, all these very specialized cells. That can all happen from the zygote. Once the zygote begins to divide, that gradually changes. While it's a morula, it's still totipotent. But once it becomes a blastocyst, and that's going to be, you know, that, 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 that ball, right? And once that, that gastrulation and that tube inside of it starts to form, from that particular point, the cells that are on the inside are going to be pluripotent, which means they can give rise to a bu bunch of different things, but they can't give rise to all the cells. So now they're beginning to specialize. Once those pluripotent cells, now that's where stem cells come in right there, folks. Stem cells can give rise to all the other types of cells that make the circulatory system, the nervous system, and the immune system. And at that point, they're unipotent. They only have one job in life. Now, if you're kind of wondering where this all fits in, from the very beginning, once that zygote is formed, the genetics never changes, right? You don't get rid of any genes. You don't add any genes. As those cells become more and more specialized, as they eventually become circulatory system cells or immune system cells, they still have the genetic information and it'd be the, all the other types. The immune system cells still have the genetic information in between the circulatory system cells. Even though they're unipotent, they only look at one part, they only turn on one part. The benefit of stem cells is stem cells up there at the pluripotent stage, they haven't done that yet. So if we wanna grow body organs, we need to grow a liver, we take a pluripotent stem cell and we turn on or artificially induce it to turn on the genes to make liver versus heart. If we decide to take that pluripotent stem cell and make a heart, then what we do is we turn on the heart genes to turn heart cells versus liver cells. That's basically how cell stem cell theory works. Right? That's why it's important to go back to that point where those cells have not differentiated. If you remember from mitosis, that's what happens, right? There's a, a period when the cells undergo differentiation. Stem, stem cells don't do that. Now, of course, what happens between the pluripotent inner mass cells and the uh, unipotent cells is this whole idea of, of, of differentiation of the development of tissues, of the development of organs. And that never happens in the pairs of the sponges. They don't have defined tissues or organs. But what's really cool what they can do, they can fragment. Yeah, that's kind of neat. So if you take a sponge and you grate it on a cheese, a cheese grater, a, a live sponge, you grate it, right? Each of those lumps will grow back into a whole sponge. That's kind of neat. You can't do that with us. You can't take a cheese grater, which I wouldn't suggest you do anyway, but you can't grate your arm and expect each one of those to grow into another Steve or another whomever, right? It doesn't work that way. But you can when your cells are relatively simple because they're not really unipotent. Even though you've divided them all up, they can say, well, we can go back to being all these different kinds of cells we need to be to make a whole nother sponge. That's the benefit of being fragmented. Sponges live in high tidal areas. A lot of tide moving back and forth. Sponges getting knocked around, getting broken, getting tossed all over each other. What a great way to live in that kind of environment, being a fragmenter. So what? Oh my goodness, I lost part of my sponge. Oh no, I'm gonna die. No, you're not. You're fine, because that chunk is gonna become one of you and you can grow back the piece that, uh, that, um, that you just lost. So you're a sponge. Again, you do so well with so little. But if you start growing from the single cell to the four, there's a blastula, maybe even a morula in that third picture in the upper right. And then, of course, right there, there's the blasta, blastocyst. Then you form well-developed tissues, and we call use eumetazoans. Oh, by the way, sponges are called parazoa. Para means kind of like. Zoa means animal, zoology. If you're eumetazoas, then you're animal-like. Meta means multi, many cells and you're truly multicellular, again. You know, it's at various degrees, but at this point, we're pretty much, you're, you're multicellular at, at that particular time. Now, again, what do all those pluripotent inner uh, mass stem cells, what do they become? Well, they become this really neat collection of cells, the nervous tissues uh, collection of cells, which again, allows you to think and process thought and think about quantum and all those weird things that I don't understand. Connected tissue, would binds us together so we can move and jump and 
and run and fly and cardiac tissue that never gets tired until you die. Just pumps, pumps, pumps. Skeletal, which uh, does get tired. Smooth muscle, which helps us uh, move stuff around in our, in our intestines. And, and, and uh, it's very much different when we look at it under the microscope. It's the reason why it's called uh, smooth. Epithelial tissue, our most important organ, tissues make up organs in our bodies, our skin. It's uh, what keeps us uh, keeps the nasties out for the most part. That's why wounds or cuts to skin are bad things. The nasties in. Body cavities. All right, body cavities. Triploblastic, diploblastic. Very simple. Triplo three, diplo two. Plastic tissues. Plastic means how many tissues are formed when we form that blastula that we looked at earlier. If you form three types of tissues, and you can jump down just a little bit, the ectoderm and the mesoderm and the endoderm, you're triploblastic, and that would be us. That would be the worms, insects, a lot of the critters we're gonna look at. If you're a cnidarian, the sea is silent, or you're a tenophoran, the sea is silent, on both of those, uh, a jellyfish or cone jellies, you only have two tissue types. You're diploblastic, those are the only ones. Remember, sponges have no tissues. These are only a collection of cells. Now we get to find out why it's important during embryonic development to have those three tissue layers. Why to have that blastocele so you can have an outside, you can have an inside, you can have stuff in the middle. That's because the stuff on the outside, the ectoderm, and sometimes the phrase that we use in zoology is ectoderm is a germinal layer. It doesn't make germs, it just germinates into other cells, not germinate the same way as a spore though. Think about it as the, uh, where they come from. The ectoderm, those cells begin to divide and they specialize and they grow together and they become the integument, they become the nervous system, among other things. That's where your spinal cord comes from, that's where your brain comes from, from this ectodermal tissue. Cool. As they turn on genes and turn off, or as they you know turn off certain genes and become specialized, the stuff in the middle becomes the skeleton and the muscles and uh, and, and, in the, and the parts that's on the endoderm becomes your digestive system and your intestines. And I've left out a lot of the other body, body parts, obviously. But all those body parts that we have are separated into three big groups based on where they come from. The ectoderm, the mesoderm, and the endoderm. That is if you're triploblastic. Again, it's diversity. It's difference. It's variety. It's the ability to do all these different things that animals can do. So sorry, I love you plants, but turn to the sun, eh. I kind of like the ability of an animal to fly, like for example, of birds. Now we're gonna talk about body cavities because that's important. You can't have these germ layers, these endo, ecto, and mesoderm, unless you have a, a, a cavity. Unless you got an outside, an inside, and a middle. So it'd be in the picture before. Body cavities are important. They allow again for that diversity. Body cavities apply a uh, lot for the accommodation of, of different organs to do different, different things. So now you're specializing into the point where some of y'all take care of digestion and the other ones take care of the endocrine. The other ones take care of, again, the nervous tissue, uh, the skeletal tissue, right? You guys are going to, you guys are going to all be, uh, you guys are going to all be uh, accommodated by not only the different germ layers, but the fact that now there's space in the body cavity to form all these different body parts are going to make us important. Support is important, especially if you think about it like, a, for example, a worm. A worm has a hydrostatic skeleton. Uh, what is that? Hold your, hold your thumb over a, a water hose that's on. You feel it. The hose stiffens up behind. That's because there's a, there's a space in there. There's fluid in there. The worm's using that body cavity to be able to do that. That's how they move around, too. Get this development of very efficient, very specialized of, of body systems when you have a body cavity, folks. So that's, that's a benefit. of it. Now, speaking about body cavities, there are some animals who don't have that. Of course, we're not talking about the sponges. And we're not going to be talking about the uh, um, the cnidarians, the jellyfish, or the or the, or the or the comb jellies. We're only talking about the triploblastic. So there are organisms out there that we call acelomate in the upper right. That's a flatworm. That's a planarian. Today. A planarian. Now notice the color has has stayed the same. The blue is the stuff from the ectoderm. The uh, uh, yellow is going to be stuff in the endoderm. The stuff in the pink would be the stuff that comes from the mesoderm, except for these critters don't have any mesoderm. Uh, excuse me, they have a mesoderm, but they don't have any body cavity. So the pink would usually be what lines the body cavity. That's what I meant to say, excuse me. But you notice in the picture, the pink is all spread throughout. 
The pink tar part is mesodermally derived tissue. So the body cavity I'm talking about is not the digestive cavity. That's the tube inside the tube. So they've taken the worm and sliced it. So you're looking at a cross section like a loaf of bread or a slice of bread. So the endo endodermally derived tissue is in yellow. Notice the acelomates have no body cavity. The, the inner body is filled full of mesodermally derived tissue. There's not a lot of space for accommodating of, of all these body uh, uh, functions that we talked about, but that's okay. Because these organisms do well. Flatworms are still alive today. They just are kind of limited as to what they can do. All right, so these are called acelomates because in science, when we put an A in front of a word, or if the word starts with a vowel, the A-N, it means the opposite of. And seal means a space. So acelomates do not have a space. The other two down below do have a space. They are coelomates, but one is faking it. That's what we mean by a pseudo coelomate. It's a technical thing. There is a body cavity. It's not like they have a fake body cavity. You can't have a fake body cavity. You do, you don't. But it's a technical thing based on those germ layers again. If you're a pseudo coelomate, only one side of the body cavity is lined with mesodermally derived tissue, the part in the pink. If you're a coelomate, that meaning those qualifiers in the front, both sides of the body cavity are lined with that mesodermally derived tissue. See the part in the pink. The acelomates are the flat worms. A good example of a pseudocelomate would be the round worms. And then a coelomate would be you and I, we're coelomates, and also are the segmented worms, like the earthworms. The term worm is kind of misleading. Lots of things are worms. And again, within those body cavities is where we get all that specialization. Circulatory system. Come on, stop. There we go. Any questions so far? We're going to go back into the lab in just a second. I just got a couple more slides to get through this part. Oh, this is really kind of neat. Remember, I talked about circulatory system. Grasshoppers have an open circulatory system. There we go. Worms, you and I, we have a closed circulatory system. And you can see what I mean by that. The open circulatory system is the heart. Blood is pumped out into an open space. We call them sinuses. Uh, there's the word, hemolymph. A mixture of blood and lymphatic fluids are called hemolymph and all those are kind of floating around surrounding the organs whereas a closed circulatory system you know you have the arterioles and the venules and there's never there's never a gap there's never any blood being dumped out notice in the open circulatory open circulatory system how the how the blood gets back into the heart it's kind of neat to me a uh, open circulatory system the heart being the pump kind of like if you threw a pump into a pool pumping water from the pool, back out into the pool, from the pool, you know, but it's in the pool itself, that helps. If you have an open circulatory system, you're gonna be limited though. It's kind of like uh, not having trachids if you're a moss. If you have an open circulatory system, you generally stay small, you have a low metabolic rate because you need the higher pressure in the other one. You need the higher pressure in the closed circulatory system to become bigger, uh, you know, more diverse, more sophisticated, if you will, with higher metabolic rates. So that's why we see among the worms and you and I and some of the other critters, uh, we have a closed circulatory system. Now, in larger organisms, the heart becomes very important, especially if we're talking about organisms that are going to be very large. You need a much bigger pumping organ. For the, for the hearts that we have in the, in the worm, those do just fine. The worm actually has these, uh, they're not really hearts. It's got a dorsal vessel, which is the main heart and auxiliary hearts. They're vessels that pulsate. So those vessels squeeze and pulsate, that's what moves the blood around. Good for a worm, right? But if you had a closed circulatory system, you're gonna be a human, that's not gonna work. You're gonna need this big pumping organ to move that blood around. So notice how these things are all correlated, right? They're all correlated with, with, between where these org organisms live, how they live, sort of the thing that the moss accepts, that the moss is gonna not have trachids, it's gonna live a, a, a lifestyle relatively low to the ground, it's not gonna grow very big and it's gonna be Pretty much confined to diffusion to be able to move stuff across. All right, back to this idea of embryonic development. Among animals, this is an extremely specialized process they go through. It allows for them to come up with all the different types of organisms to see the diversity that we go through. And it starts back at the very beginning. And it separates very quickly into two big groups of critters, which are written along the side there. And the blue is something called protostomes. And the other is deuterostomes. 
stones. We remember what the root for stones means. Stones. Stones. Is that better with the light? It's a stone. You actually have a couple of stones. Probably have more than a couple. Yeah, it's an opening. There you go. Now, a protostome, proto means first. This means first. And deutero, you saw back in deuteromycetes, when we looked at in uh, fungi, means other. Or in this case, think of it as second. Um, and you'll see in a minute what I mean by first and second in this case, protostomes and deuterostomes. But let's kind of start back where I said at the very beginning with the four cell embryo. If you're a protostome, the four celled embryo, the next step that's going to happen is an eight cell. You're going to add those cells that are in blue. If you add those cells so that if you look from above, it looks like the cells have twisted 45 degrees, like I was showing you in that picture early in the lecture, you undergo something we call spiral cleavage. And it makes sense why it's spiral, because if you look at it from above, as those cells divide, they twist and twist and twist. Okay? If you're a deuterostome down below, your uh, four cell stage becomes an eight cell stage. You start these most radial cleavage. The cells just divide on top of one another. They don't twist. Right? There's one big difference between them. The next thing that happens is the fate of the embryonic cell. So we go at the four cell stage. This goes back to the totipotent, pluripotent stem cells and all that discussion we had just a few minutes ago. If you take a protostome, and you remove one of the cells at the four cell stage, development is arrested. In other words, they have development we know as determinate development. At the, four cells, at the four cell stage in protosomes, cells have already decided, have already differentiated. They've already become what they're going to be. If you take one of them out, those genes that were turned on in that particular cell, even though all the other ones have it, don't get exercised, and that particular part doesn't develop. The organism doesn't develop. In other words, you don't get an offspring. You can manually go in and do that, remove one of those cells. If, on the other hand, you have indeterminate development, development like you and I, you can remove one of those cells, and the other cells haven't differentiated enough yet that they can't pick up where the other cell that was exercised or excised exercised, excised uh, when it was removed. That's why we have identical twins. Indeterminate development or identical twins could only happen with indeterminate development. In identical twins, one sperm fertilizes one egg and then it splits. Well, if it had determinate development, you got two half embryos. That's not going to work there, right? And finally, between protostomes and deuterostomes, and there's a lot more protostomes and deuterostomes. There's only a couple of us deuterostomes out there. I said us, we're one of these guys. That's why we can have identical twins, by the way, is uh, the formation of the body cavity or the coelom is what we're saying. So we're back to this idea of taking a ball or a balloon and pushing our finger into it and forming an arc aneron, which now if you kind of follow to the very end, see, that's what I mean by a tube within a tube. There's the mouth, a tube grows all the way through, it forms the anus, the part that's the endoderm is going to form part of the digestive and the intestine system. So this is the, the body tube that forms in the body cavity. If you push that thing with the balloon all the way through, this is what you would make if the balloon did pop, which of course it would. Okay? If you're a protostome, where does that pink? That's mesodermal tissue. That's the stuff in the middle, right? The stuff that forms part of the skeletal system of an organism that have it. Well, that tissue fills in in the middle from cells that are floating around in that space. This here is the blastocele again. A little bit smaller. So, right there. That's sorry, blastocele. So the mesodermal tissue is filling in within uh, the blastocele. That's where the mesoderm came from. Remember, that's specialized tissue. So it's eventually going to form together, and it's going to form what you see in the picture there on the far right that I just pointed out. If you're a deuterostome, though, that mesodermal tissue comes from cells that come off of the yellow part, which is the part that's going to be the gut, which is a really cool name known as the arc enteron. Arc enteron means primitive gut. Arc is primitive, and arc enteron is gut. 
Now, without getting too much into the embryonic development beyond this for animals, this allows the incredible diversity we see in animals out there. As I said, most of the critters we're going to look at are protostomes. There's only a couple of groups toward the end, you and I included, that are the deuterostomes. But this allows, again, for that specialization of organisms. And again, it kind of goes back to the cells, doesn't it? It's all about the different types of cells and how they can specialize. That paper I was reading a couple summers ago makes sense, doesn't it? And I think the last thing we talk about segmentation, very easy, real quick. Organisms are segmented. Look up above, this is your, uh, what we might call an archetypical um, crustacean up above. And they've got eight cephalothorax segments and six abdominal segments. And we'll, we'll look at segments a little more when we look at our crayfish. Get that stuff off the screen. Um, and the head part are known as the cephalic segments. Uh, the chest is the thorax. And sometimes the segments combine with one another and they form these big functional groups. The abdominal segments can combine, but if you notice, like in this one, look at the appendages coming off the segments. In the front are the antenna, the feeding segments, and the walking segments, and down. If you think about a lobster, look what a lobster looks like, right? And a crayfish. I was gonna say the crayfish will do in lecture, but unfortunately we won't. Now, what does segmentation do? It allows organisms to specialize, right? In the front segments, you're going to put the sense in the feeding organs. In the middle segments, you might put the walking legs, or if you're a lobster with pinchers, which Florida spiny don't have, but the ones up in Maine do, you might put the pinchers there for defense. And in the abdominal segments are going to be the digestive system and musculature because you're using that to swim with. And if you're uh, familiar with it here in Florida, you know that in female lobster, right there is where they'll carry the eggs. So you can use those little. Um, appendages in the back to kind of help you swim along and to carry legs. Even the lonely crayfish there on the right, which is uh, nowhere near as complex as, uh, or earthworm, excuse me, not crayfish, as the crayfish is specialized or is uh, segmented. Notice it's got little lines to it, it's segmented. If we were to open those up, which we will when we start talking about it, we find out the, the benefit for the uh, earthworm to be segmented is repetitive. In each segment of the earthworm, there's a kidney, for example. Every segment's got its own kidney. Oh, oh, more than one, actually. Oh, oh. If one segment's kidney fails, get a backup on either side, no big deal. So in this particular case, what mother nature has gone, is gone for maybe, let's say, quantity versus quality. Although the kidneys do a really good job, the quantity of a lot of this organism will survive in general if it loses one. Now, you know, you lose a kidney, you can survive. You can't lose both of them, though. This organism's got several, so you can repeat. And what you can do with segmentation, too, is you can specialize from front to back. In the front, you can have the, again, like the crayfish, the food gathering and manipulating. In the middle, you might have, if we're staying internal, you're going to have the digestion that's occurring, stomach, intestines. Later on, you're going to have in the intestines the processing of, of fecal material, waste products, right? So you can specialize not only among cells, but among, among parts of the body. Redundancy, flexibility, if you're segmented, you can be flexible and variability. All these are segmentation. This is all known as metamerism. Segmentation is metamerism. I think that's the last slide in that lecture. I believe it is. Let me leave that up for a second. All righty, folks. Uh, what do you, if, I was going to say, if you need a break, I, I need just a couple of minutes, so why don't we go ahead and Take just a just two or three minutes just to run down the hall real quick. Take a break if you need to, and then come on back and we'll go ahead and finish up the rest of the lab for today. I'm gonna stop sharing this. No, I'm not. I'm gonna leave it going. Maybe I can pause. I'll just turn off the share. Yeah, there we go. So I'll be back in just a moment and we'll get back into lecture. Oops. I am back now, just a second. I forgot to, I don't wanna, maybe you guys have to hear.
Helps if I unmite my mute. Try it one more time. Hello, everyone. I'm sitting there thinking, would they all bail on me? All right. Good deal. So we're back in business here. Let's take a look at part B in the Nidarians. Again, the C is silent in that case. And how do you know it is? Well, you just learned that it is. And in biology, when you see words like that, CN, usually the C is silent. Kind of one of those things like phone, huh? Nobody says telephone. Right? Now, here's have radio symmetry. So that means direction is not important to them. And if you think about what we're talking about in Nidarians, it's the jellyfish, the anemones, and some other critters that we'll take a look at. Someone that you're probably more familiar with than you think you are. Sit down. Of course, I'll jump up here in just a second. Now, what unifies the Nidarians? Here's an example in biology where uh, a, a, a particular characteristic unifies everybody in the group, and it's only found in that group. And these are the things that, if you lived in Florida, or lived here for any period of time, you're very familiar with, and that's the stinging cells. Nidarians sting you, many of them do. And that's because they have things called nidocytes. Nidocytes are unique to this group. That's the part that's highlighted in the bold, just about halfway down. Uh, certain nidocytes are the things that are really problematic because these are nematocysts. And what nematocysts do is they shoot out a barb that you, when you brush up against, and that's used to capture or subdue prey or just to make you leave me alone, right? The stinging, of course, you move away from, you're aversive to it. That's probably a pretty good, it's kind of like the, coming out of the, uh, the palm, the, the, the sago palm, right? Those really hard needles that, dissuade you from moving in through the leaves of that, although some of you were more than willing to do that. Um, Nidarians can come in a form that we call a polyp. A polyp is a growth. It's usually going to be a sessile, so a polyp is going to be something that grows along uh, some sort of substrate. Corals, for example, are polyps. So substrate, this is going to be your Nidarian, or grow as a polyp. Other ones have the stage that comes from the lady with the uh, Medusa with the snakes in her head, and that's because they have tentacles, and that's your typical what your jellyfish looks like, right? Yeah, there we go. That's not bad. This is the polyp. A polyp is a growth. You know, you might hurt a colon polyp, for example. And this is named again after that Greek or Roman I don't know. Medusa. That's the Medusa. So there are examples of polyp. Nidarians, they're an example of Medusa Nidarians. So think again, coral, uh, jellyfish, and then there are those that go between those two. So a part of their life is polyp, and a part of their life is Medu uh, Medusa. And uh, if you're kind of thinking over here, dispersal, wow, that's good for dispersal, you're right. We're gonna look at an organism in just a second that it has a Medusa form, it's only gonna form gametes. So it's kind of weird, because it's kind of like a gametophyte thing, but it's not a gametophyte. You'll see what I mean in just a minute. Um, let's take a look at Hydra under the microscope. One second, folks. Again, if you want, you can always follow along online. Just find a picture of a hydra. There's probably pictures of hydra that are labeled with the things that I'm going to want you guys to be able to identify. It's a dirty slide right there. But contrast. Let's see what hydra looks like. Switch cameras. In the right place. All right, in the red is the organism. It's like a creature. Let me see if I can do something to that image. I think I can probably flip it so it makes a little more sense. No, that didn't work. 
Let's go with this and see if that's a little bit easier. All right, there's the, there, this is the top. The microscope flips it, but this is the part that we're facing up. So this is a polyp that's facing up. Duncan, I wish I could make it do that. But if I flip it, it always flips it left to right. Does everybody see what I'm talking about here? So that's the very top, and coming out of the top of that polyp, I didn't show you that before, but indeed, if you've got the medusa with the tentacles hanging down out of the top of a polyp, you can have tentacles that are facing up, right? You just drew something on the, on the board, but I realized that you can't see the board. Now you can, right? So the polyp can have these tentacles that are facing up. And whether they're, or their tentacles are the cilia, they're going to do the same thing. What do you think those tentacles facing up as they're waving in the water? What do you think their purpose is going to be? So if we go back to the hydra and take a look at it under the scope, check this out. Pull the scope up on this. That's cool. The only problem is you don't get the same size it's kind of neat right so if you think about those are all tentacles and they would be facing up again if i had to have it facing the right way uh what do you think all those polyps would be doing as they're waving in the water yeah that's right capturing food using their stinging cells to subdue prey uh keeping you away you know you get too close to them the, and this is a microscopic this is hydra this is a freshwater but think about it, some of the bigger ones, right, keeping you away. The stinging cells that are in the tentacles, they can also be in their body. So if you were to brush up against them, if you've ever been down the Keys and you might have swam through some of the seagrass and you felt it stinging on your, on your stomach, that was little miniature hydroids. This is hydra, hydroids that did that. They had their, their little stinging cells stung you as you swam by because, ah, don't rub me, don't rub me. Uh, hopefully not enough that you, it bothered you unless you were allergic to that kind of stuff. So if that's for capturing food, then what do you think is that little opening right here or those two little openings side by side just past the tentacles if you're thinking about the tentacles as being facing up what do you think that is you kind of a mouth now here's where we kind of get in this idea of specialization there you go that's probably a better way of saying it here yeah absolutely that's where we get into specialization we're going to call that open area there inside of the gastrovascular cavity okay so it's the opening if you will and what goes on in there well gastro stuff food goes in and gets digested by the way notice too that there's only one opening here so this critter only has it doesn't mean it's a it is a protostome, by the way, but it doesn't mean that that's why it's a protostome. But this only has a mouth. There's no anus. Hungarians don't have an anus. Their mouth is their anus. So uh, food goes into the gastrovascular cavity. It's digested. It's absorbed. It's mixed around. Uh, the mixed around or transporting around is done in there as well. It's basically going to work through diffusion. There's no vascularization in these critters, no blood vessels. And once that stuff is all mashed up and chewed up and done away with, it's going to go back out through the mouth slash anus and be deposited as waste. It's not a bad lifestyle, I guess, except for the mouth anus thing. Now, you, you may have saw hydra maybe in, uh, under a microscope when you were in high school. Many times there are uh, hydras, you can find them in pond water, not as common as I would like to find them. But they are, instead of being a protozoan, once again, they're small, but they're not. They're an animal. They're a cnidarian. Kind of neat, huh? I'd describe everything, mouth, tentacles, gastrovascular cavity. Okay, that's hydra. Now, hydra is going to stay a polyp and remain a polyp. And the only time hydra is not going to be a polyp is when, I'm going to switch the sharing for just a second, folks. Folks, let's try it one more time. There we go. All right, let me share these images. And now you see the, the Hydra right there. I got a little better one that kind of backs out a little bit. I can't figure out how to make the microscope. It's on the lowest power, but it just doesn't look the same on the screen. There's, there's Grant here, by the way, that we looked at earlier, right? There we go, there's hydra on the left-hand side. Now, hydra, being a polyp attached to the bottom, is gonna reproduce a variety of ways. They can form gametes that are released out through the mouth slash anus and mix out into the water. 
uh, which would be sexual reproduction, but can also form uh, buds that they're called during asexual reproduction. Very similar, oh gosh, maybe kind of similar to what we saw in yeast cells, right? Now, the benefit of asexual reproduction, once again, I'm sure it's something, it's a, a, an old adage that we've gone over a million times, is, is speed, right? We're just cranking on offspring. You're not going to get any diversity, though, but you're going to get a lot of offspring. So if you take that picture in the microscope and rotate it almost 180 degrees, that's what you're looking at, different color. Oh, that explains it. Learn something new every day. All right, any questions on Hydra? I'm gonna show you Obelia next. Obelia is really, oh, Obelia is another Hydra uh, relative, but very different, obviously. All right. Oh, that's not even a focus at all. The location fidelity on this isn't the greatest. Let's start easy first. Oh, there you go. That's a nice picture. So this is Obelia. That's another hydra, hydroid. All right. This is what we call a colonial organism. And if you're thinking what's colonial versus multicellular, good question. It's again fitting right on that line. We like to call this a colonial critter, even though it's, it's multicellular. Again, we're still dealing with cnidarians, so they're not true tissues yet. They're not tissues in the way we define them in animals. You know that. And what I really want you to notice about this is the diversity that we see among the polyps. This is a colonial polyp organism, so unlike one hydra, each of those little, there's two in the picture, but you can see the branching of, of a bunch or some up above it as well. Each of these are little polyps, uh, uh, different types of polyps coming out of the same critter, that colonial uh, hydroid. The polyps that I want you to look at first is the one kind of in the middle of the picture on the right-hand side. Now, again, these would be facing up. It's upside down. In the, I'm going to just put the slide upside down, but I don't feel like doing that right now. But notice you see something on there. Let's do a little observation here. What do you see on that polyp on the right as I've changed the focus? Chat function open. I need, I need another set of arms. Yeah, that's what I, that's right. You want me to do that? No, I'm gonna, I'll do it on the next one, but I want to, I found this one in the same image field. That is a good idea though. Yeah, you're right. That's what I should do. Again, anybody got an idea about that that polyp on the right? We'll talk about the one on the left if you're if you're kind of puzzling with that one. That's fine. But the one on the right is one that I think has some stuff in it that you recognize, especially if you think about the the group of uh, Nidarians this belongs to. And like Rhea said, if this was facing up, it would be it'd be a little better. So imagine it is, which it really is. You don't have to imagine that. It's just not in the picture. You see those little things sticking out? Projections? I don't want to get too specific and give it away, but what are those, do you think? Knowing what you know about morphology and body structures of these critters based on what we just saw in the hydra, what would you guess, what would you surmise those might be? Yeah, that's what I would say, right? And Ian, if they're tentacles, what do you think those tentacles are used for? Or anybody. Production of food. Well, food. Capture of food. Yeah, absolutely. So capturing of food. Uh, and of course, the stinging cells would subdue the prey and all that sort of stuff. So when we talk about a colonial hydroid like this, we say that different polyps do different things. And so the polyp we just looked at, the one on the right, what's its job? What's its job amongst the colony? So if they got together at a polyp meeting, they would say, you, you're going to do this. So what would this polyp be responsible for doing? 
I know it's capturing food, but what's that overall biological function that's necessary that means you have to be able to do that? Don't forget bio one. I think one of the characteristics of life I remember was, yeah, metabolism, uh-huh. So that would be involved in food gathering. Now, look at the other polyp. That's why I'm kind of putting these together because different polyps do different things. What you're looking at in the other polyp, and it's not, well, it's not too bad in this picture, honestly. All those little dots or those little shapes, one, two, three, four, or five, those are mini little medusa. Remember the thing with the tentacles hanging? I'm doing my fingers and you can't see me but there are the tentacles hanging down. Uh, those little tiny medusa are going to be liberated one at a time. Boo, 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 going to be liberated one at a time out of that polyp. And what those medusa are going to do, there are male ones and female ones. It becomes kind of bizarre because not every jellyfish you see in a medusa is this way. But in this particular organism, those medusa make either sperm or egg, depending on whether they're male or female. Then the sperm and egg mix, and then you get a reproduction. So those medusa, or the, that other polyp with those medusa, what's its major function? What does it provide for the colony? My glasses are right in the middle of focus. I'm like, mm, I'm doing this, you know? Yep, there you go. So guess what? You got food. Oh, oh, even better. Thank you, Ian, for reminding me. You got food with the tentacles. You got reproduction, like Rhea said, with the with the uh, with the Medusa and producing the gametes, and of course those Medusa go or go out into the environment, and then they loop along, swim along, if you will, and they release their gametes and they disperse. Wonderful, everything's taken care of, everybody's happy. This organism has been around for millions of years, and so whatever's working must be working pretty well. So uh, if I were to be focusing on drawing a picture, and again, I'm not much of an artist, you guys have figured that out by now, but I would make sure that in my image, however uh, sophisticated or crude it may be, I would uh, indicate what I'm looking for and the difference between the feeding and the reproductive polyps. And folks, it's a simple answer. You're gonna look for the tentacles. Only the ones that are the feeding polyps have the tentacles. The other ones are gonna look like little Medusa. And Ian answered the next question for us, uh, perfectly, being that the polyp form is sessile, it was Ian, I'm sorry if I'm not giving credit to the right person. Uh, I don't have the box in front of me right now. What purpose is served by the free living Medusa? Yeah, I think it was Ian. dispersal. And, and in that particular question, it's important that you understand what I mean by free living, the free living Medusa, it swims on its own, so it can disperse. amazing how different organisms use different ways to accomplish the same procedure. Like back in the plants, right? We saw that there were wind pollinators and insect pollinators who disperse the, the, the pollen, which contains the male gamete. We saw there were different kinds of, 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 of ways of dispersal of seed, either through uh, seeds or uh, through fruits or through cones. And, and, and some of those seeds had wings. I mean, it's, it's all the same answer. It's convergent evolution in a really big scale. All critters on the planet, no matter what you are, fungus, plant, animal, you're dealing with the same stuff because we're all dealing with the same environment. Make sure you can recognize those two polyps, okay? Make sure you can recognize them. You know, I'm a form and function guy too, so make sure you can tell me the difference between them in terms of what they do. You guys ever seen a platypus? Of course you have, right? It's like an animal that was designed by a committee. But the platy part of it is interesting, P-L-A-T-Y. You might know what that means to be platy, like in this critter we're looking at here, part C, the platy helminthes. I'm trying to think of another place. Well, out west, where I lived a lot of my life in West Texas, there were features out in the desert that were called plateaus. And that has a lot of the roots the same. Maybe that helps. And I focus on this, folks, because I tell you, learning a little bit of the lingo is really helpful in, in disurfering, uh, <laughs> in figuring out what words mean, which I just made one up there, right? I think it did a spoonerism, two together. <laughs> Deciphering is what I was looking for. So platy, P-L-A-T-Y, what do we know about plateaus? Anybody been out west and know what a plateau is? Yeah, it's a, it's, it, it, it's a table, right? It, it's flat. Plateaus are flat. Platy helminthes, helminthe, if you went to the doctor uh, and your kid was showing symptoms of pinworms, which that would be him scratching 
around his anal region quite a bit. Uh, the doctor would perhaps, uh, if it was bad enough, prescribe your, 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 your child an anti-helminthic medication. Hel helminth is worm. So platyhelminthes is a flat worm. And yes, 30% of kids get pinworms, which is what I'm talking about. So it's not common. So if you had pinworms as a kid, there's no shame. If you play in dirt, which you probably should as a kid, you probably had pinworms. Anyway, these worms are all flat, and this is going to represent those really bizarre organisms like the flukes, the parasites that you want to look at, but you can't because they're kind of gross, but you still do, right? Parasites are fascinating to me. And these organisms don't have a whole lot going for them, right? They actually have a, a, a acelomate, no body cavity. Oh, I shouldn't say that. I'm just going to get to my professor in college. They do so well with so little. But what I mean by that is the fact that they're going to live a fairly simple life. Let me see if I can get you a picture of one. Here's a, oh, there we go, on the left-hand side. Now, he looks like, you know, it, it's cross-eyed, but he's not. They, they have an eye spot. Oh, this is a good critter for me to talk about a lot of stuff that we went over in, in evolution so far. So this is Dugesia. Dugesia is a planarian, and planarians are flatworms. As a matter of fact, they're flatworms that we may like because planarians are generally not uh, parasitic, whereas the other flatworms, like flukes, uh, those kinds of things, they generally are parasitic. So these, I don't believe there are any parasitic planarian groups out there. Let's get rid of the hydra. So what is, uh, what I mean by the planarian living a relatively simple lifestyle? Again, without a body cavity, they're not going to have a lot of accommodations or diversification of body functions. So there's not going to be a lot of real specialized stuff like uh, endocrine and digestive and all those things we've talked about. You do have a gastrovascular cavity, which is, again, very much like uh, in the cnidarians, right? It's just a, a, an internal pouch where food can be digested. You remember how the, the, the fungi, remember how they digested their food right on the outside? We said that worked, but there's a lot wasted there. That's what the roots of the trees take up. But if you can digest your food on the inside in the gastrovascular cavity, it's more efficient absorb all that food. Unfortunately, being a planarian, you do suffer one of the, the fates of the, of the jellyfish. You only have a mouth, or let's just say a mouth slash anus. So food comes in uh, through a mouth, which is actually called a pharynx, right in the middle. Your mouth is in the middle. It's like a, 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 a tube. Uh, planarians can actually stick that tube out, and um, it, it's, uh, they suck up food, right? And so that's the mouth. Goes into the gastrovascular cavity, churn, churn, churn. Waste products back out through the fans. Not a bad life. Don't have much of a vascular system at all. You, you, know, you don't really have the vascularization that we see in the critters that we talked about in the circulatory system. You still not need to, to get waste products across. You still need to get food into your body. You still need to get water across your cells. So does it make sense to you thinking about that based on what we talked about in mosses, why you don't see big giant planarians out there? There are some good size ones, Florida has one, but why you don't generally see big giant planarians? What do planarians have to rely on to get those materials across their cells? You know, waste products and food and oxygen and water if they don't really have a fancy vascular system, which they don't, they just have a tube inside. If you're scrolling back through for the answer from a few uh, from lecture earlier, yeah, you're, you're finding the same one. There you go. Thank you. Yeah, it's all going to be diffusion. So if we're going to predict where these animals are, we're going to predict how these animals are going to be in terms of size. We're going to predict they're going to be small, right? For the same exact reasons that we talked about the mosses. For the same reason you learned in oh, it's been a while since I did bio one chapter four, where you talk about cell size, surface area to volume ratio, right? Planarians. Uh, 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 Planiomenthes are flat and small because being flat and small means you have a much higher rate of diffusion across the cells. And remember, when you're small, diffusion osmosis might work for all your cells all the way to the middle. When you're big, you got those cells in the middle and that's not going to work. You're not going to be able to, diffusion is not going to diffuse far enough. Osmosis is not going to move far enough through that dense mass of cells to take care of those cells on the inside. Um, the auricle. Auricle is, uh, well, we use the, the word auricle to refer to this part of the ear. Uh, they don't have a sense of hearing. The auricle is just basically a broadening of the head in that region. That actually varies from different species of planarian. Some have a real prominent auricle, some do not. 
this guy in the sample here was unfortunately cross-eyed. Actually, they always look that way. Those aren't really eyes. Those are eye spots. Hmm. I remember talking about eye spots. You guys remember talking about eye spots? What do eye spots do? I know it's an obvious question and an obvious answer will, will work. Stand a little closer. Eye spots. Yeah, they see, right? So do they see the way we see? In other words, does the planarian see me the way I'm seeing it? Or the way you and I are seeing each other? Any of the rest of you can chime in. So do would I expect a planarian to you know read the paper? If it had the mental, yeah, no, of course not. It can sense light though, can it? Would an eye spot sense light? Yeah, not clearly. Thank you, Carrie. That's exactly right. Yeah, sure. More, more of a dark and light thing, huh? So you remember back talking about what good is five percent of an eye, ten percent of an eye? Stephen Jay Gould's rhetorical question about acceptations about what good is only having part of this fancy thing we call an eye. He said, well, because it didn't, wasn't an eye like we have today. It wasn't a camera eye, but it helped sense light. Now, if you're a planarian, your eyes are on top of your head and you're a small little soft-bodied, probably really tasty critter, would having some way to sense light moving above you, let's say, for example, you lived in the soil or in water, would that be something that would be selected for in Mother Nature? You could avoid certain light. That might be one thing, especially a critter like this. You want to stay out of the sunlight because you might dry out. But, you know, think about something if this were a, a living in the water, something swimming over top of it. That eye spot, you couldn't tell what it was, but you could tell it was a shadow, couldn't you? You remember what Stephen Jay Gould said with his little tongue in cheek question What good is 5% of an eye? Nothing. But it depends on how you're looking at it. 5% of the eye we have today is nothing. The camera eye we have in us today. But in the evolutionary past, anything that would sense light, would presumably be preserved, even an eye spot. Even though if you can't tell what predator is, you can tell something swimming above you. You might duck off into the weeds and survive another day where all of your buddies said, ah, see, like that rabbit with the longer ears. Eye spots, auricles, pharynx, and digestive system. Any questions on that? There is a Florida planarian, a really big one, where I see, relatively speaking, I had the picture in the lecture slides, but it's really easy to tell if it looks like a big, long, striped worm and it's got that spade-shaped head to it, it's a planarian. Let me a picture if you see something like that. Oh, Ascaris. Doggone it. This is our first dissection. Well, I always say don't get too excited about your first dissection. It's exciting for me, but if you're, especially like for the shark in the third week, which is a lot more exciting, I do like to keep the Ascaris nematode. Nematode is a round worm, so this is going to be a worm. It's a pseudo coelomite, by the way, that Ruby talked about. It's the classic tube within a tube body line, and that's why I use Ascaris. We still dissect it. There's really not much to uh, dissect about Ascaris, but it shows you once again that life can survive without being complex by our standards. But all you need to have is the basics. So let me see. Do I have a picture of a male and a female Ascaris? I don't, but you know I know where I can get one. Hold on one second, guys. Let me find a picture. I meant to load this first. I want you to be able to tell tail. the male from a female Ascaris. Ascaris around worms, you probably, if you have pets or been around pets, you know they get them. You work in a vet clinic. You've seen Ascaris. It's a white round worm. If you call your doctor and say, my dog just pooped and there's white worms in his poop, he'll say, come on in, I'll give you an anti-helminthic to get rid of it. Mm, that's not bad. Let me see if I can share that image with you. Apologize, folks. Let me get back. Come on, pop up. There we go. Um, hmm. 
There we go. On the right hand side, there we go. So it's a small round worm, white worm, not very big, can grow a, a few inches. I don't think a foot, but not much bigger than a, say a pencil, much smaller, half the size of a pencil, I would suggest. On the right hand side is the male, on the left hand side is uh, the female. That's how you tell them apart. They're sexually dimorphic, and that's why I introduced them here to make you understand what that word means. Just like when we're talking about dioecious plants, uh, dioecious plants are plants that have a male and a female, but we kind of extend that a little bit further and, and say that when we talk about dioecious, we can actually talk about whether they're sexually dimorphic. These organisms are. You can tell the males from the females. And if you're wondering, can't we tell on all? Yeah, but like for example, sea turtles are, are historically very difficult to tell males from females. It has something to do with the tail length, but doesn't always fit that way. So it's not always a characteristic that stands out. But these organisms, it does. The uh, females have the, or the males have the hook on the left-hand side, and the females or don't have a hook. Males have the hook there on the left-hand side of the picture. Females don't have a hook. Where's my... Okay, let me stop that. Get back into the lab manual. There we go. And we got to click in both spots. All right, so you have the male and the female. The males are the smaller. They're usually thinner. Uh, females usually bury the brunt of reproduction. So many species, females will be larger, uh, where males will be, in, many, in, in some cases, quite small. Think about a male and a female black widow, male and female prime manis. Uh, the females have to bury the brunt of reproduction and providing the yolk for the eggs or providing for development of the offspring. So once again, as I tell my bio one students, eggs are expensive and sperm are cheap. So males are cheap compared to females. There are even some species out there, uh, we'll get to the rotifer for today, that only have females. There are no males of the species whatsoever. You can fertilize your own eggs. You don't need male, by the way. So, On the outside of that, of that worm, if we were to cut it with our dissecting knife, I would tell you guys that you're gonna, it's very easy to cut through, but you're going to notice at the very beginning it's going to have a little bit of a, of a resistance. You have to pop through that resistance when you're cutting it. As you're cutting, you're going to cut down that worm longitudinal. And the reason why that resistance is because that worm has a cuticle on the outside, sort of like your nail, right, has a cuticle. A cuticle is a hard structure. These organisms are endoparasites. Where do they live? Where do endoparasites live? E-N-D-O. Unlike their friend, the mosquito, who is an ectoparasite. Yeah, under the skin or within inside, inside of you, right? So these are endoparasites. And many times they're in the digestive system. And in the digestive system, it's not a particularly nice place. It's uh, acidic in the stomach. It's very basic in the intestines. And it's just a place full of some nasty materials. Although there is some food there if you can make it work. So the worms, and you can get round worms too, by the way, live into your intestinal gut and they eat the food that isn't absorbed by the intestines. Of course, that's not good for you being the host because you're being robbed of some of the nutrients. But that cuticle on the outside provides a little bit of protection against the nasties, the toxic materials, the toxic environment that it might find in the intestine. So when it asks, I think the third question down, there we go, these animals are internal parasites of pigs and humans. What is its food source and how is that related to the way it lives or the structure? The first thing you want to say is, and this says the digestive system there too, I should actually add this part to that question, is that cuticle provides a little bit of a barrier to living in such a harsh environment. Now we're going to dissect a male and a female. Yeah, there you go. It works, right? ABC already been chewed. The function of the roundworm's pharynx, just like the same thing that we saw in the flukeworm, that's where the food goes in. They do have a mouth and an anus this time, so these guys have both. And what feature of this animal do you think allows it to survive in so many diverse habitats? Let's take a picture, or let's look at a picture. Here's one dissected down below. Female on the left, male on the right. I'm not concerned about you knowing the differences in the sex uh, from the internal sex organs. As you can see, it looks like spaghetti. It's very hard to tell. If we were doing dissections, usually about half of you are lucky enough as they're dissecting out the female, they do actually, it's very easy to do. 
but they don't slice it up so bad that you can't see the uterus. They have two uteruses, two uteri, and they split at the vagina. So it's a Y shape. And sometimes you can see that in there. The other part that's in the smaller part, those are the oviducts and the ovaries. And it, it's really a matter of size. The uterus are thicker tubes. Uh, the oviducts are a little bit thinner. And then the ovaries are like what I think about is angel hair in comparison. That's it to them on the inside, by the way. Reproductive organs and, dig and digestive system. For the male, it's, uh, it's similar. They have the, the, the big tube in, in the male that's running down the big flat ribbon that's labeled, that's the intestines. The female has one too. Yeah, it's labeled there. So there's the intestines and all the rest is reproductive. It's got testis and the vas deferens and the seminal vesicle. That's about it. Mouth at one end, anus at the other. Digestive system, reproductive. All right, back to that question. What about the way they live their life is reflected in their function? What about the way these organisms live their life as a parasite? And Ian, yeah, Ian kind of hinted to it with his comment about post-digestion food. But what feature of this animal or features maybe do you think allows it, or overall feature allows it to survive in so many of these different environments? Well, that's one of them, right? Protects them against that, but think about diversity. In other words, they live in the intestines of pigs and humans and and other organisms, and pigs are notorious scavengers. They'll eat most anything. Humans eat lots of different things. So living where they live, how does the way they're put together allow them to deal with all the different kinds of food that are brought in by these hosts that they might be living in? Yeah, that might help, yeah. Some of them are small in the intestines, hard, not hard to see them, but kind of going back to the digest, did you see a lot of, um, specialization in that organism, even in the digestive system. And heck, I just pointed out two, two systems, didn't I? Yeah, could be some of that, depending on what they're susceptible to. But I was thinking more along the lines of, you know, how can these worms, yeah, they can adapt, right? They can digest most anything, can't they? They're just a simple tube within a tube body plan, that's all. There's no strict requirement of the types of food they can bring in. There's no need to have a pancreas to emulsify fats or anything like that at all. You're just doing absorbing. You're not even digesting. You, you have a mouth, but you don't have a digest. You don't have a stomach. You have a tube. You're just basically taking ABC, already chewed food, already been chewed food, floating it through that tube and absorbing it through diffusion osmosis. Simple. And you're alive. And there's lots of you. And you infect lots of different places. So these organisms are doing a pretty good job living as simply as they do. That's kind of what I get out of the dissection lab, to be honest. It's, like I said, a bit anticlimactic, right? People get into the dissection lab and, they go, and then you realize life can be relatively simple with all due respect to the, to the roundworms out there. All right, does that make sense that I answer those questions? So the cuticle, the fact that it can digest so many different things, the fact that it's a really simple kind of, it's basically an absorbing uh, uh, organism. It just absorbs. It doesn't really have to go much to digestion. Uh, oh yeah, last one. Oh, we're running a little bit early. Any questions for me, folks? Let's look at the rotifers. These are cool. Going under the microscope. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Thank you. All right. Oh, of course, these guys can be facing anyway. <laughs> We'll see. <laughs> the best one is it's like the one in the middle. I'm like, yeah, perfect. Pretty good. Actually, uh, well, there we go. There we go. I got one that's got a little bit of dye, so it's got some. Let me switch back to here. Focus in a little bit. I might be able to go. Oh, 
All right, so it's facing, well, these things don't really face up. They can face in any direction, but if you think about the top of the organism is to the left, the bottom is to the right. This is a rotifer. This is a, a, a small critter, might be found in a drop of pond water. I'm sorry it's not focusing exactly, but if you have, uh, you know, you played with microscopes enough now through two semesters, you realize that at higher power, the depth of focus is going to change. So I'm actually focusing on the top and the bottom of the critter, so it can't all be in focus at one time. So anyway, these are found in drops of pond, uh, pond water, but they are not protozoans. They're multicellular animals, just like you and I. I mean, a little bit different than you and I. They have a head, which is off to the left, and I can't really get it on the microscope, what I want to show you, but I'll describe it to you in just a second. Actually, I can show you another picture. They have a trunk, which is just off to the right, and then they have a foot off to the right-hand side of the picture. Their foot is uh, more like, let's call it a hold fast, yeah, like we saw in the brown algae. So this is an organism that is sessile, attaches to something floating in the water typically. They can move around, but they can use that foot to hold on to things as well. And on that far left-hand side, oh my goodness, I never thought about this. There's a corona. Oh God, that's a virus. But on the far left-hand side is called a corona. And these organisms are sometimes called wheel organisms. W-H-E-E-L, because under a microscope that's alive, that corona looks to be spinning. Almost looks like it's spinning around. Now, if we were able to focus in on it a little bit closer, there we go. On the right-hand side of this image, you can see what's causing that thing to spin. There are little hairs or cilia, if you will, that are hanging off of that area on the corona, and they're moving and they're circulating water. Because just like all the other critters we've seen before, or many of the other critters, this is a filter feeder. So it moves water around, right back to the sponge where we started lab, moves water around and some of that water has food in it. It's then captured by those, uh, those cilia and then dragged into the mouth. And you can see there's actually a digestive system, the part that's in the, in the gold, I guess, golden color. I'm not sure what the red thing is. Maybe just musculature or something like that. But, well, it couldn't be musculature. We're not quite there yet, but, but that is a rotifer. Kind of neat, huh? In a drop of, you've probably drank a few rotifers in your life. You don't even know it. You're not swimming in the lake or something? In regards to food gathering, provide an explanation for the presence of cilia on the edges of the corona. If you're thinking, my goodness, that's a repeat question, it is. But the, the, the important part of understanding that's a repeat question is to understand the similarity of lifestyle due to similarity of environment, which is something I've been saying since the beginning of the semester. Now, I'll, I'll leave you guys with one little thing about rotifers to ponder because we're getting toward the end. You're more than welcome to stick afterwards after if you have questions, but I'll finish this up in just a moment. Uh, rotifers in many species, like I said, only have females, Let me sh I'm going to go back to the board for a second. There are no males. There's a type of reproduction out there that we used to think was limited to relatively simple critters, if you will. That's not the right word for it, but it's known as parthenogenesis. P-A-R-T-H-E-N-O. Parthenogenesis. Yeah, that is actually. Parthenogenesis is females who produce fertilized eggs. Oh, in other words, they produce a zygote. They don't produce an egg and then a sperm comes from another organism, a male, and fertilizes the egg. They produce a fertilized zygote. Now, why would that come about? Well, for one thing, if males are short supply, then fertilizing your own eggs, if that mutation were to arise randomly, is a pretty good thing to have since the whole idea is to reproduce, right? evolution, that's the whole idea is to reproduce. So if there are no males around, then produce your own fertilized eggs. And then after a while, you don't need males at all. It's not a matter of males not being around. It's like, what do you need males for? We can produce fertilized eggs. We don't need males. Now, if you're thinking, what about diversity? Yeah, that's a problem. But you know there are ways around that, right? Produce a lot of offspring. DNA, uh, uh, copying DNA even for an asexual reproduction isn't the same every single time. You're going to get mutations. Now, we used to think this was limited to simple stuff like this, right? Uh, maybe some insects. But we find that it occurs in reptiles. We find that it occurs in fish. The best uh, story 
is a, a sand tiger shark that was kept in captivity up at the Shedd Aquarium in Chicago, wasn't around a male for over 10 years. After a long weekend, the trainers came in and that sand tiger female had given birth to pups. Hadn't been around a male for over 10 years. Now there are some species of fish that can store semen, right? And then fertilize those eggs later on, but that's not the case with this critter. So that critter, a sand tiger shark, you wanna think about complexity, was able to produce female that, uh, or able to produce offspring without having a male. So far we, uh, we've seen it in reptiles, birds, mammals, it's been done in the laboratory. We've gotten it to happen, but we don't know if it occurs in the wild. But if that does occur in mammals and spreads throughout, let's say for example, the human population, that kind of sends that's all we need for males, right? You don't need a, a male around if you can fertilize your own eggs. That's what I always told my daughter. Remember that, sister. All right, folks, I don't have any more when it comes to this. I'm gonna turn off the recording. Uh, any questions you have, you know where you can find me. Please continue to work on your assignments. We will have the exam next Monday, uh, and I'll give you more details on that, how that's going to occur. And um, what else was I going to say? Assignment, your field notebooks. Keep working on those, everything I said about the beginning of class. Does anybody have any questions before I sign off? Uh, I don't know. Uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, sorry, Laverne. The mouth and the anus is, uh, wait, well, oh, rotifers have a mouth and an anus. Sorry, they have a mouth and an anus. Uh, I don't know about diatoms. They might be similar in, in I, don't know, I don't know if they have silica. Some might, Ian. You're welcome, folks. Thank you for, let me.